What's up, everybody? Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. If you want to stop fucking around and actually find some coffee that doesn't suck and is also made by amazing people, you need to go to blackriflecoffee.com. My personal recommendation is the coffee club. That's what I'm a part of. And you can select however many bags you want, whatever bags you want, and uh, have them delivered directly to your house. Also, I highly recommend the uh, ECS, which is basically an exclusive coffee experience. Hand selected by Evan. Not a big deal. BlackRifleCoffee.com. Check it out. My guests, plural, today are Kara Smith, also known as Kara the Huntress, and Nick McKinley. Both are representatives of Deliver Fund. Now, if you didn't know, January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, although it should probably be every single month. Specifically, it is this month. So who's Nick? Let's start with him. Well, he spent 11 years as an Air Force pararescueman prior to being recruited by the Central Intelligence Agency, also known as the CIA. During his time there, he served as a country chief for a special unit within the CIA. During that time, he witnessed not only the epidemic of child trafficking within illicit markets, but also the opportunity to apply his understanding, experience, and training to influence this global crisis. Kara spent 12 years as an intelligence analyst for the United States Air Force, where she deployed supporting counterterrorism operations, tracking and locating terrorists using state-of-the-art military technology. And after leaving the Air Force, you know, why not continue and just work for the NSA and then at the FBI and the Terrorist Screening Operations Unit as a senior intelligence analyst. She is now a senior analyst for Deliver Fund, an organization designed and dedicated to ending human trafficking. And on that note, I shall be quiet. And allow you to enjoy episode 215 with Kara Smith, also known as Kara the Huntress, and Nick McKinley, also known as Nick. Okay, I got the red smoke. Sun runs north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute, give it to me, I need it. Get clear and hot. Copy, clear and hot. She's That's, I mean, if you were to say, yeah. hey, what platform was this comment on? I would say Twitter or YouTube. Peer, straight up. Got to yeah. be YouTube. Oh, it's just fucking trash. Got to be YouTube. And, and not only that, but like, there's only so many things you can think about from your mom's basement. So, I mean, think about this. Have you, I have actually found that to be infinite. I would like to think there's only so many things, but I'm constantly surprised. Yeah. How, how many comments have you left on YouTube? Uh, I have written some responses to people. Right, but have, like comments. Like you watched a video and you were like, you know what? I want to comment on this. Exactly, is yeah. my point. So if you're commenting on YouTube <laughs> videos, like it just goes to show a little bit about like maybe who you are and where you stand in humanity. The only time I've commented on YouTube is from the first podcast. In and, response, though. In response to people. Yeah. yeah, and like, thank you, yeah. cool, it's really nice. Or somebody... Had like someone off the cuff craziness. I'm like, is that really how you feel? Like, come on. <laughs> it, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful thing, right? That interconnectedness. And it's a terrible thing because I wouldn't voluntarily go into somebody's basement where they're wearing tidy whities with like Cheeto stained fingers. And Mom! Like, yeah. Meatloaf! Like, and a TV remote control missing somewhere inside <laughs> one of their, you know, fat rolls. I, I don't know necessarily if that's what I would find in those basements, but that's what I think I would find. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to guess stereotypes are stereotypes for a reason. Oftentimes. Oftentimes are true. They're true. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. I have two questions for you guys that have nothing to do with what you do at Deliver Fund, which I want to talk about. Um, and I will let you guys choose the order. Carrie, you get to choose the order. We can go uh, recent events backwards, or we can come forward. So I could go with the most historical question first, or the most recent. There's actually mm. one for each of you. Oh. Before we get into the fact that January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, which what do you guys do with the rest of the 11 months out of the year? I mean, it's, it's got to be a really hard job to just only do it in January. Vacation. Yeah. 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 We just we just really kill crank it out for 30. Kill ourselves. Or how many in January, days are in January then, before? <laughs> <laughs> we just take vacation the rest of the year. Yep, the whole we have that whole one month, and then you know it's a pretty cush job. Yeah, yeah. I didn't so. know actually until you and I were texting that uh, it was Human Trafficking Awareness Month. I feel on all of the months that have something dedicated that we should pretty much think about them at all times. Yeah, more right. than just like a calendar page. But that's me. 
All right, let's go with historical first. Historical first, Nick. We have to talk about the drawdown of Afghanistan. Oh, good God. <laughs> <laughs> Only because, I mean, A, your background. You got oh, scotch in here somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. there's scotch over here. <laughs> A, your background, right? And, and I don't know what level you'd want to talk about um, what you were involved with as all of that was going on. So I'll let you, you know, talk about that in the terms you want to. But thoughts on our withdrawal from Afghanistan. I'm sure you spent five or six minutes of your time in and around those areas working on those problem sets, if you will. <laughs> My thoughts are I prefer not to think about it. Well, that's not what I, we do on this show. I tried to avoid it. Yeah. Uh, so, and I only ask because I get bombarded with it as well. In my experience, um, I had some people on who I finally was able to have somebody on who was sitting at tables when like doctrinal decisions were being made. Like, should we commit to this country or not? The human capital pros and cons. My exposure to Afghanistan and Iraq was at a very, very low tactical level. Sure. So I'm, I'm curious. Shoot bad guy in face. Yeah. I mean, hopefully. I'm assuming you're on the right target, which... About, I was going to say too 50, soon. I was going to say soon. fifty fifty, but it's like twenty eighty. Twenty being the correct amount of time you were there. Eighty, like my bad. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some some cash for that door we blew up. And, Sorry about and that. the goat. Um, but your level of you know you were working for an alphabet soup organization at the time. I'm always just uh, curious your thoughts for people who spend time there. So really interesting, uh, just, just by way of background, um, most of my time in, in Afghanistan was split between Camp Chapman, Lashkargah, and, uh, and Lashkargah, like city proper, not, not Leatherneck, and then uh, uh, Fabmahalik, uh, so Kandahar. So like the, the pivot points of the war, I got really fortunate to, to get to be in those places, right? Yep. Um, sit in QRF for UBL raid in Kandahar with some of your old brethren and some, some AFSOC dudes. And then, uh, from there is really when, and I got to watch those doctrinal decisions unfold only because, um, the, the agency element on the ground with the, you know, the, the kinetic capability was my unit. So it was like, right. What can, and can we not do when you start talking about drawdown or not draw down, you know, where do we go? What do we do? Then, you know, the last guys out are always, always the shooters. So uh, yeah, we're also the ones that kind of are responsible for maintaining the explosives and ammo, making sure that, that stuff gets out too. So in developing those plans, um, I had a team leader who was, uh, had a less than robust work ethic. And so a lot of that is the ATL ended up falling to me and putting together plans and spreadsheets and stuff like that. So I, I got to be part of that in watching it all come together. And what I can say is what I always say about our military and intelligence services, the people on the ground are world-class. They're awesome. They do a great job. Whether or not the policymakers will listen to them is a complete other yeah. Uh, uh, other uh, conversation. So, th so the plans were really good. I mean, really good. I mean, warfighters are really good at, at <laughs> XFIL, right? And, and that's basically how it was. It was a, a massive logistics XFIL exercise. We XFILed out of Iraq. That went pretty well. So why didn't Afghanistan go well? I mean, I think ultimately that's what everybody wanted to know. There was a plan on paper. It did not involve Kandahar uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it did not involve uh, Kabul. It involved Bagram Air Base. Yeah. Um, it involved leaving, I believe it, the number was like 2,500-ish, uh, essentially shooters and support and, and air support behind in order to keep our enemies at bay and in order to make sure that the, the Taliban did not get over, or did not overrun the Afghan security forces. So when we remove all that, we all know there was a plan and it was a good plan, and regardless of whether or not or, or how anybody feels about the current administration, the reality is, is they chose not to go with the plan that was put together by the professionals. When you look at the dissent cable that was leaked that came out public and, and for listeners who don't understand, if if you're a career diplomat or your career intelligence and you and you send a dissent cable to the White House, like you are falling on your sword. <laughs> digitally <laughs> that is what you are doing there there is there is there is, there is no coming back from yeah. that from a career perspective so when you have a a an embassy staff and an intelligence staff that is willing to send a dissent cable to the white house to the oval office 
saying what you're doing is a bad idea, it's that bad of an idea. Yeah. And um, now there's the other piece of this that we need to that we need to address, which is the Afghan people made their decision. Now, did we help them along in that decision by pulling all their support? And so the commanders were like, well, I can die fighting these people or I can just take the bribe. The reality is, as I understand it, granted, wasn't wasn't on the ground, haven't been there in, in a long time now. But as I understand it, a lot of those commanders had already been bribed yeah. before the Taliban ever showed up. That's why that's why does that surprise you at all, given your experience there? No, and that that's a whole other conversation yeah. that we need to have as a country <laughs> that goes all the way back to to George Bush. So this isn't this isn't a Republican issue. This isn't a Democrat issue. Like it's been, every yeah. single yeah. administration had the opportunity to to put the corruption down, and every single administration chose to look the other way. And um, the book, The Afghanistan Papers, uh, if anybody's read it, I'd say it gets it about 70% right. There's a lot of stuff that the author just couldn't know because they yeah. weren't there. But but for the most part, it gets it, it gets the gist of the corruption and, and, and it, it highlights it pretty well. So I think when you look at that, um, the the Afghans made their choice. The commandos, you know, where there's been lots of talk about um, evacuating the commandos, and I'm going to get a lot of heat for saying this, but I have I kind of speak truth to power quite well. Um, the whole point of creating the commandos was so that there would be commandos on the ground there. So why are we? The the whole point was never to evacuate them all, right? Yeah. So, well, my, if the country's going to stand on its own two feet, it has to have it that. has to. Yeah. So I actually don't have a lot of sympathy there. Where my sympathy lies is with the women and children because they didn't make this decision. They've never had the opportunity to make these kinds of decisions and they've never had the autonomy to make these kinds of decisions. So that's why when you reference, you know, what, what we did at the Liver Fund, what we're involved in with, with Afghanistan, um, we're very fortunate, um, but also, and you could say lucky, but I kind of like to think that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. Um, we're pretty good at what we do. And so the second 737 of, uh, of Afghan citizens post the evacuation uh, was actually our plane. We got it out. That uh, we then got two more out, and none of the folks that Deliver Fund got out are sitting in a refugee city somewhere. They all have political asylum in Portugal. They're all being taken care of by the Portuguese government. I mean, it was it was a geopolitical chess game like I have never played before. It but you was, were playing it outside of the boundaries of working for the U.S. government, right? Like this is something that you. Oh guys, no, we were working directly with the White House on this. No um, shit. Yeah, because I don't have the ability. I mean, thanks for the vote of confidence, but I don't have the ability to pull leverage. Oh, I just assumed it was somebody power. that works for you, but you were taking credit for it. No, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I, uh, I I understand that you would think that being a seal, but I'm not a seal, so I don't do things like that. <laughs> I mean, do children, do children, like children, behave. We are behaving. Okay. This and is just this is the way we behave. Yeah. I think Nick's being modest, though, like talking about. You the, were working your ass off. He, like to the point you actually reached out to me. You're like, dude, I don't know when was the last time that I slept. I need like help doing this. I was like, fuck, man, I wish I could help so you. So I, but. I hit, I definitely hit capacity. Um, I'd been, we'd been working 20 ish hour days for about. Uh, close to two months and that's when I like literally threw up the flags to everybody and was like hey if you know anybody preferably with a senior enlisted soft background who can freaking pitch in and help and then that's when you introduced me to uh, no actually you didn't introduce I did me to know. Zach um, Ollie introduced me to Zach yep. and he's a freaking rock star I hate to say that being that he was a freaking retired SEAL Master Chief, but he yeah. was an absolute rock star. He, he well, when the Air Force struggles, incredible. who do you call? You've usually the SEALs. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> so here's I, a I question. <clears throat> here's a question for you. I've, I've had a few conversations and obviously quite a bit of time to think about a my limited time in Afghanistan. And it, I think it's easy when people talk about the conversation, they'll frame it as at an administration level, like, oh, is it Democratic, Republican? And I couldn't, I agree with you so much. Every time I talk to people, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this shit started long before Trump and long before Biden and before Obama. Like, it's left or right. I don't care where you sit. The whoever was It goes riding, all the way back to Reagan. Right, yeah. Whoever was riding the horse you want to claim that you were attached to, like, it, trust me, part of it was in, in their bucket as well, too. And that, that conversation, I think, is often framed at that level. But the, I look back at my own time there. 
and the military has a little bit of uh maybe a a lot of i don't know the right word uh guilt or blood on their hands as well too and a, mm-hmm. a question for you about the partner force you trained with because this is where i came to the realization that you know <clears throat> one i'm not surprised by what happened. And I've asked every person that I know directly or come in contact with that served over there. One was, are you surprised at what happened? Every single one of them said no. The most common sense of surprise, and this is the one that I share, was the velocity with which it happened. And then if you dive deeper into that conversation, it's like, well, why aren't you surprised? And they'll almost always go back to, well, we had a required partner force, as I did as well. And the ratio increased as the war went on. When I first started off, my first deployments over there with uh, you know, the East Coast SEAL team. I don't remember having a partner force. Mm-hmm. It was very, very kinetic and very targeted. By my last deployment, it was a one-to-one ratio mm-hmm. of Afghan to Americans. And the capability of those partner forces, and I'm sure it varied depending on the unit that you were with or the, the province that you were in, we propped them up. Mm-hmm. We, would, we would train with them to the best of our ability, but after spending a little bit of time training with them, and having some thoughts of like, I wonder how they would do on their own. It's a rhetorical question in my mind. Well, I think that but depends. We pitched, but we still, though, and the reason I'd say that, you know, it can be taken down even to the lower tactical level because as a as a West Coast-based SEAL Team 3 ensign, who sometimes wore 04, depending on the meeting, was very, I was very rank fluid. It to, happens. It happens. You can identify <laughs> however you want. I, if we wanted to operate... We had to take a partner force. So we would take a partner force and mitigate the role that we would allow them to have. So we would have our own safety in mind and also be able to operate. Yeah, because you couldn't trust them to not shoot you. Correct. But we're still fucked because we're living a lie, I guess is what I was trying to say, right? We're trying to live by, with, and through-ish, asterisks, however you would want to describe it. And that was, and I'm not talking about a, like, well... I guess it could be viewed negatively. Like I said, I've just had a lot of time to think back to it. It's easy to nail it on the policy members, but at the same time, at the tactical level, we knew it was fucked too. And we mitigated it so that we could do our job. But I, after six minutes, and I'm not actually joking about that amount of time, it could be less than that, you realize, oh, fuck. Like, if left on their own to their own devices, this shit's not going to stand. I think for us, it was a little bit different uh, because my my experience in military soft was very similar to yours. My experience at the agency with our partner forces and these very specific um, tribal platoons that we created, um, actually we didn't create them, though we worked with them, uh, it was uh, a ground branch that created yeah. them, um, very good. Yeah, I'm talking very, like A and A, A and P, the, like in Zabul Oh, no, no, in these, Zabul these, these, were, the, these yeah. were the ones that were not really on the government books yeah, <clears throat> incredibly competent, very, very good. I mean, if you you've got to hand it to yep. uh, the GB guys. However, most of them were well. Actually, that's not true. Most of their contract staff is former SOF. Most of their staff, not so much. Um, they did a very, very good job um, on and and they didn't have a one to one ratio. There was more like thirty to forty indig to one yeah. U.S. Uh, ratio, right? So, I mean, they're... That's the true by, with, and through. Yeah, they did a very, very good job. Now, you can go back and say, should they have been doing that job? That's another conversation. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, and then, should they have been doing that job, um, or, or should the military have been doing that job under the same authorities that the agency was doing them, right? So, so you get into this, like, what I used to like to call the uh, uh, the authorities card game, right? Oh, you're talking about like the Title 10, Title 50? Yeah, battle? it's like I used to get up every morning and it'd be like, you know, a, a, a cable from general counsel sitting there being like, all right, so, you know, today, you know, this operation is Title 10 and this one is Title 15 and this one is Title... I'm like, I've never even heard of that title. I don't even know what, I, what I'm allowed yeah. to do there. And that that's a whole other problem. So when you look at the bureaucracy, and I think really what it comes down to, and again, I'm going to get a lot of heat from this from military leadership, but every enlisted guy is going to know what I'm talking about. It used to be that officers and commanders and generals were on the battlefield. Now they're watching a screen and a talk. And they're not there getting the experience. So your most qualified leaders today are not general officers. Oh, they're, they're like 0203. 
Yeah, they're they're senior enlisted guys. Yeah. Right? It's your E8s and your E9s. They're the ones that actually have the major majority of the experience and the combat leadership experience because they're the guys who've been making calls on the ground in real time as events unfolded. That used to be an officer role. You just don't see that happening anymore outside of fighter pilots. But fighter pilots aren't in a aren't in a direct kinetic engagement anymore right until we get into a near peer war that's not really going to happen so really it's it's that it's that senior enlisted soft guy on the ground who's making the calls in real time that's where your leadership experience is and so and that guy maybe gets tasked over to talk duty because he made somebody mad or screwed something up or it's a good career move or Right. I mean, that's that's yeah. the reality that we've gone and we've got to get back to the <clears throat> basics in, in the military and, and and putting putting the leadership in the field, not in the air conditioning. Even when that senior enlisted operator goes to talk duty, which I'm not even going to begin to unpack <laughs> some of the acronyms used. That's the Tactical <laughs> Operations Center. Sorry. Uh, it's fine. People can look it up. He's a, he's one voice among many. <clears throat> right. And he's also not the senior man. Right. So it, I think it helps, but it also depends Man, I've seen some very senior enlisted people completely mitigated due to personality conflicts. Absolutely. With a single sen- senior officer. Yeah, and then you have a senior officer who spent his entire career in space command and is now all of a sudden in charge of you know making tactical operations because they went to some leadership school that taught them the theory of combat. It's like, well, hey, strap on some armor and let's go. Let's go talk about the actual. Uh, application of it. So when you yeah. start when you start looking at that and you, you just compile everything to, to kind of shorten the whole conversation here, you know, we didn't it so at Deliver Fund, we didn't we didn't evacuate a single commando. That's not our job. We evacuated women and children. Because if you were a military aged man and you're in Afghanistan, you really need to get your women and children out of there so you can pick up a rifle and fight for your country. Yeah. Or don't. But I don't have a whole lot of sympathy there. My sympathy is for the the women and children who didn't make it is specifically uh, when I say children, it's not even so much the um, the boys, it's more the girls and what their what their what their future holds like, for them what, yeah. what their complete lack of future held. Uh, and so that's when we when we got asked and we were I mean, it was we got asked by the White House um, by you know political appointees uh, at the, uh, at USAID under Samantha Powers to help out. And and that's also just so listeners understand, that's how broken the system is, where you have somebody who's number three to Biden and runs an entire government bureaucracy and their hands are so tied that they're like, well, we got to do something. And so they start reaching out to nonprofits for help. And they only knew us because we were working with the White House on broader human trafficking policy issues yeah. and, and funding issues. So it, it's absolutely tragic. It's a stain on our country, unfortunately, and one that um, I I get asked a lot, well, what does this mean for the future? What it means is my son most likely will have Afghan dust on his boots. I feel the same way about it. That's the if, way if I frame earlier. it in my own thoughts as well. Yeah. To digress, because you brought up Space Force, how bitching would it be to be a door gunner on the space shuttle? With fucking laser cannon. Would you do it? Absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, what does but Space Force so actually do? Do you have an answer to this? <sighs> Let me make one up real quick. <laughs> I have and no I'm idea. not saying that negatively. No, I, I, I'm I, curious I, about Space Force because maybe too. I want to join. Me too. And But here, here's something that will really blow your mind, uh, Mr. Uh, Pro Skydiver. Space Halo. Ooh. Like, does it work? Does it's a fine it line there. I you mean, might go up, but maybe down. Or side to side. <laughs> <laughs> right? So does that mean you actually have to strap on a jet pack? Now we finally get the jet packs so that we can yes. get into the atmosphere so that then we can deploy the ship. I mean, dude, I got, keep, I keep, got questions. Keep dreaming. They're never going to let you guys back in. But keep I mean, if they need somebody who has <laughs> those exact skill sets, we're talking to the right people here. And, and actually, I mean, I could consult. I don't have to come back in. Then that's not entirely true because they need they need somebody to test stuff on and like we're so washed up and broken yeah. you don't want to hurt the like the real like yeah. the good dudes yeah for sure <laughs> all right you ready for your question my question sure more recent Ghislaine Maxwell hmm. ah yes yes what do you want to know about her <laughs> I want to know the odds that she will get given a sweetheart immunity deal and roll on all these other motherfuckers because so that's what she... I want to happen. 
I don't think she can get an immunity deal off mm-hmm. of it because she's mm-hmm. already been charged. So she's not going to get an immunity deal. She hasn't been sentenced, though, But she right? still has to be sentenced. And so there are minimum requirements for Damn it. them. Maybe immunity the was the wrong term. So there's a minimum and there's a maximum. If she were to get maximum sentences on all of her five charges out of the six that they were putting her up for, um, the five that she got found guilty on yeah the maximum is 65 years so she would die in prison yes and Mm -hmm. so looking at it if and and i might be mistaken i think the minimum is around 20 years off of all those sentences together how old she now 60s she she turned 60 on christmas so there's a chance she still may die in prison uh, hopefully yes like via potato peeler there's no way she's getting out of this (laughs) she could she could end up pleading uh uh pleading guilty the same way that epstein did uh (laughs) i'm just fascinated by a couple things by that trial, like the lack of coverage comparatively. And I know you were following it pretty closely, and that's why I was I was curious. Again, it doesn't – I mean, I guess it does directly tie into what you guys do. It, the it amount directly of conversa- ties into what the we do. The amount of conversations, though, that I've had since having both of you on about human trafficking, and uh, I actually – I mean, it's not a big deal. I'm pretty much a spokesperson for Deliver Fund because almost all of those conversations have ties to sexual trafficking mm-hmm. and i had to explain like oh yeah 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 that like that's the vast minority and i talk about just the shit i saw growing up in california a lot of the migrant workers and all that stuff completely oblivious to the fact that that was likely human trafficking without sitting down or having before sitting down and talking to you guys yeah yeah no so with the maxwell coverage you said there was a lack of coverage uh, there's a lot of coverage actually it's just you weren't seeing it on your mainstream like fox like but why and CNN and things like that. Well, one, it wasn't televised. And like most federal trials, they're not televised. That's just the way it is. Also, specifically in this case, the people that were testifying against Maxwell were doing it anonymously. There okay. were several of the accusers point. that yeah. were testifying anonymously because when they were victimized by Epstein and Maxwell, they were minors. So they are child sex trafficking victims and imagine carrying that stigma around with you publicly they had the courage to stand up and speak against the the person that sexually exploited them in public and they they simply wanted to make sure that their lives weren't ruined when doing so. So you can't have cameras in the courtroom in that instance. So the way you would have to follow the the trial, and I figured this out, and I'm like, nobody's going to be paying attention to this. And so on the medium that I did it on, I did it on my Instagram. And mm-hmm. every single day, I followed all the reporters that were in the courtroom, whether they were live tweeting or blogging, whatever it was, and I combed through all of it. And then I was putting up literally a play-by-play of what was happening in the trial and the information. So, I mean, it's not watching TV, but you're still getting all the information. And then, I mean, if you simply just went and looked for news stories every single day, there was a lot of like good key points of things that were going on. Uh, So the lack of coverage is because it wasn't as easy for media to visualize it for people. Which is which is a problem, and then um, I think there was a couple other huge news stories that were going on that week. I don't even remember what they were. A couple other trials and other things that went on, so it got buried. And yes, there are news organizations that didn't report on any of it, and they put it under like you know five pages of information, and they ignored it. And yeah. why did they do that? Because with all human trafficking cases, people don't like to admit that it's happening. I also don't see how they can ignore that it's happening, though. I, I would almost fall into the category that they don't want to admit it's happening because they don't actually want to pull on the yarn and see how far back it actually goes. I I, th- I think it's less, uh, it's less subversive than that actually, and that is that it's it's become such an inflated issue around uh, the conspiracy theory uh, communities. You know, human P- trafficking in general. Yeah, the pizza gates and all that stuff. So you were talking that, about that before we started. I actually wasn't aware that there was conspiracy theories around human trafficking. So oh, please boy. enlighten me. It's the biggest pain in my ass. <laughs> like the conspiracy theories make our job at Deliver Fund so much harder. And so, I mean, by that are you saying that the people they, are just out there saying this is not happening? Well, they, they it makes our job harder in that it. 
it makes the awareness piece of what we do because part of it is like part of what we do is educating people that hey this is actually happening and one of the best ways to educate people is to actually conduct operations with law enforcement so that you can say hey look we did this intelligence operation law enforcement did a sting operation ergo this guy goes to prison for human trafficking um here's what that looks like yeah but but from the awareness perspective um, so it doesn't make our job with law enforcement more difficult, but with the awareness piece, it absolutely does. Well, the thing is at Deliver Fund, we're not just like a one-trick pony. We bring a 360-degree solution approach to combating trafficking, and awareness is a huge part of that. And the reason why we need to bring that piece to the organization and bring it out to the public is because we're not going to be able to fight this problem on our own just working with law enforcement. Everybody in society needs to be aware of what human trafficking looks like, how it happens, and how it can be solved. And when there's conspiracy theories out there, it's a shiny object that distracts from the reality of how you actually fight this problem and what it looks like. That's why you were referencing Pizzagate. Mm -hmm. Are you guys telling me that one wasn't real? Because I saw it on a documentary. That's not a documentary. That's a YouTube <laughs> channel that you shouldn't be watching. I am ashamed of you. No, it was legitimately. <laughs> I actually, I was being sarcastic because in the documentary, they basically talked a lot about kind of the origins and the groups where that began, where they kind of got the info to the point where that guy went to the uh, pizza place. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's in D.C. looking for the basement in a building that doesn't have one with a rifle, which was a pistol caliber carbine. I mean, that's a conversation in and of itself. Right. What are you like? Bro, either, either. <laughs> so, no, I know it. No, I know either exactly come ready what or you're watching. Don't. It's like, seriously, man. I watched that because yeah. I had a friend go, is this true? And if somebody asks me a question, I'm going to like do my research to watch it. But that person was if, legitimately motivated. He came from, what, two or three states away to go save the kids mm-hmm. that weren't there. So if you're talking about that type of distraction, I totally understand what you're talking about now. Yeah, so like... When you look at those big, full-blown conspiracies at Pizzagate and then the documentaries of, oh, this is why it's happening. This and little then, section was tied to a QAnon one because I was going a little bit down a rabbit get, hole. Get okay? out of that. Don't go there. I, <laughs> Netflix keeps recommending them to me. And they're right. I'm not joining. I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. How do you believe it's this? It's a train wreck. Well, guess, how do you believe this? Well, see, and that's the thing is people are going to watch that and they would rather believe that because when looking at that craziness that is created for very much entertainment and fear-driven purposes and saying this is what human trafficking looks like, it distracts from the reality of yeah. what is actually happening. And the reality is so uncomfortable, they would rather, would rather go back to that comfortable lie that they're watching instead of believing the uncomfortable truth. So watching these conspiracy documentaries and videos it's like oh my gosh that is so freaking crazy man that's insane human tra- trafficking is horrible i Let's don't think stop that it. i worry about the but, people who believe the things they believe i completely believe in human trafficking yes i worry about the people like the main promoters of like q i'm just like holy shit let me, let me give you an example of i think why this is happening because we talk about this a lot because we're always trying to figure out how to like are, are there people who believe this stuff that are absolutely crazy? Yes, they're mentally ill and there's nothing we can do about that and we're not going to bring them into the fold. I don't have enough letters behind my name and I, yep. I, and I can't prescribe drugs. There aren't enough letters or drugs to fix some levels of crazy. But there are some people who are, I, I like to think, probably average people who are just clicking on headlines and end up going down a rabbit hole and start to think, well, maybe some of this might be true. So, okay. I'll add one layer to that too. I think they will start that journey on the internet because they feel wildly unfulfilled in their life. I I feel like a lot of people who will attach themselves to this either have no sense, and I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, but I worry about that because I feel shitty for people who don't have a sense of purpose or a sense of fulfillment. But if you don't have that and you see something sensational, it's like, holy shit. Here's my purpose. I'm, I'm jumping in to help and these kids. So the problem is these these conspiracies and ideas that are not at all accurate and completely unfounded kind of plant seeds across social media and the Internet and little pieces of them will get picked up and shared on social media and the algorithms will pick them up. And then so just regular people who do have, you know, purpose in their life and aren't going to go down those rabbit holes or whatever it may be, start to believe it. 
And they're all like, did, did you hear about the kids being sold in the closets? And it's like, no, that's not real. They're like, but it's said because my friend who has a blue check mark on this social media said that it was real. And it's like, well, you man. saw this happen with the with the Maxwell trial where uh, there was a, a news commentator uh, from a national network who said that the uh, the, the records were sealed. Right. That all, we'll never find out what happened with the, the Epstein trial because all the records were sealed. Totally not true. <laughs> of course. <laughs> like literally. Um, uh, so we're actually uh, um, we've got a landing page at Deliver Fund, which is deliverfund.org forward slash Maxwell trial. All the links to all the documents are there. You want to look at flight logs going back to 1996? The links are there. You want to look at the the quote unquote little black book? The links are there. I mean, it's 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 all there. Yeah. So so you but somebody said it, algorithms picked it up just like Kara said and then it goes into bigger Some politicians things. picked it up and shared it and I think within 15 minutes of the verdict and I was posting all the information at people going, "Well, it doesn't matter cuz the records are sealed." And I'm like, "What are you even talking about?" And I I looked around and I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, there's nothing that's sealed. Everything that was provided in evidence during the trial is public record. Now, there are some redacted information in those. It's the names of the victims. (laughs) To protect the victims. Will be blacked as out. We should. Or some of the images that were shown of uh, Epstein's mansion. Well, they blacked out some of those images because it was naked victims yeah. and women in the images that don't need to be made public. And so, like, there's so many people out there that feel that um, they want to see the people who are associated go down. Um, you know what? I, a, I would like to say me, I'm one of those people. Me too. Absolutely. I would, <laughs> Wouldn't we all? I would absolutely love to see every man and woman who partook in the events that were unsavory in whether it be the London house, the, you know, the townhome in New York, Florida, or on Epstein Island. I would love to see them exposed and tried for their crimes. But the thing is, in the information that's there, that's not public record because there's a very good possibility that some of those people are going to be tried. Well, and it, it requires it requires victims. And this is an important thing for people to, to keep in mind. I mean, we have a constitutional right to face our accuser. So if we're going to accuse these people of crimes, and, and I really wish uh, the DOJ would, but they have to find victims that are willing to testify. And this, so these victims were abused, many of them as minors. Mm-hmm. And many of them, uh, Kara knows who one of them is. Um, it's a very, uh, um, would you call her a household name? Well, so she actually testified and she's, she's a prominent actress in Hollywood. And she, like, if her face was shown, everybody would know and who she is. her name was known. Mm-hmm. So she doesn't, so, you know, do you, so right now she is known as a prominent Hollywood actress who's good at her craft, who's worked hard. And as soon as she went public... In 30 seconds, she is now that woman who was raped by Epstein when she yeah. was a child. She doesn't want that stigma because it's would? her that's yeah. her career. That's her job, right? So, I mean. So it's, e- it's easy to say, well, we want to see justice. And, and yes, absolutely we do. But who cares what we want? We are not the victims. What does the victim want? And if the victim chooses not to come forward, then that we, we need to respect that. And, and there's, there's a bigger piece to this, though. And I think part of the reason why you said people are, are missing uh, mission in their life, which, which I completely agree with, but you get, and you see this a lot in the soft vet community, right? We're going to go be pedo hunters. And, and then they, they start talking about all this, this child, child sex trafficking that's happening, and they go log into their OnlyFans account. And the chances that that, uh, that woman or that who they think is a 22 year old woman on the other end of that OnlyFans account is actually a 16 year old girl who's being trafficked 80%. So yeah, there's some huge cognitive dissonance there for sure. So it's much easier to say, well, trafficking isn't this thing that I'm participating in through my OnlyFans account through, you know, my pornography addiction trafficking is this horrible thing that's happening to, to children that are being sold in the basement of a pizza parlor. 
because it doesn't it, because then you don't have to confront your participation in that. And and if you're listening to this and you have an OnlyFans account, make no mistake, there is a very 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 high possibility that you are feeding money into the human trafficking market, and that is that is that is <laughs> undeniable. Yeah. Was there anything about the trial that was illuminating for you on how they were able to accomplish what they did for so long? So when it comes to Epstein and Maxwell, like the information on what he was doing, how he was doing it, where he was doing it, even who he was doing it to was all out there. Um, you know, there's a bunch of documentaries on it out there and going into it, it was very much watching like, so how are they going to prosecute this and what mm -hmm. new information are they going to show? And uh, I, I mean, I've just I've been watching it for so many years. There was nothing surprising that it happened and him getting away with what he was doing. Uh, but he got away with it for I mean, we're talking decades, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Rel I mean, I don't want to say in plain sight because it's obviously like they didn't have billboards, but they didn't seem to also be putting a lot of camouflage well, on it either. When it comes to getting away with it for decades, there's um, two main reasons I could say why that happened. And that's because of the money that he had. Mm -hmm. And then also the fact that it's really been in the last five to 10 years that people really started understanding what human trafficking looks like and what he was doing was human trafficking. Uh, and a lot of people don't look at human trafficking for what it is. And when we say child sex trafficking for what it is, what he was doing was child sex trafficking. Yeah. And then they start looking at it and they're like but it was teen girls and it's like that's exactly what it was it was teen girls that he was paying and recruiting and creating a uh, you know mlm <laughs> out of these girls having one come in and go i you know what if you want more money like i'll pay you 300 for every girl that you bring back that's what shocks and has shocked me the most out of again the documentaries i like documentaries all right i'm sorry I I try to make sure they're from reputable places. None of them I watch on YouTube. They're all Netflix, so they have to be real. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Hulu, right? Those are really... <laughs> <laughs> no, I look at them with a grain of salt, but that when I was watching some stuff on Epstein and they would sit and they would talk with the women who were first uh, targeted or, or introduced by somebody who was likely going to their same school, it seemed like, and then they turned it's around... It, yeah, and then they turned around and, and became the recruiter. It's like, holy shit. Well, I mean, even if you just look at the um, accusers, actual victims, now survivors that testified in the Maxwell case, every single one of them, it, it's a textbook case of trafficking and how it happened and why it happened. Traffickers, no matter where they are, no matter who they are, I don't care if you're a billionaire or if you're some you know, pimp in the street, it all starts with finding a target to manipulate and finding their weaknesses and how you can use them to your advantage and break down so you could go ahead then sell them. Yeah. And so all of these uh, victims that were in this case, one of them, you know, her family didn't have a lot of money and she wanted to go to um, a music school, right? One of them had a little sister who, she wanted her to get schooling and she wanted to go to school herself. The other one had a drug addiction, right? So mm -hmm. like they were all, they all had their weaknesses. They all had their issues that were easily exploitable. And um, another thing uh, that is unique to Epstein is he had a position of power because mm -hmm. of his wealth. Yeah. And, um, you know, no matter how many times like you you come across people in positions of power and you usually end up getting used to it when you've met so many. But imagine if you're a teen girl and your parents are with you and you meet this guy and he's like, well, how about I fly her out to New York so she could see a show? Right. And uh, it's like, well, he's a beneficiary of this school. There's a wing named after him. Yeah, it can we, be overwhelming. Like, why wouldn't you send your your kid to this guy who like seems like a kind, sweet uncle figure who is charming, who has all this money, like that you have a camaraderie with? Why wouldn't you? And so the parents didn't see that. And then imagine the girl after she's been assaulted. Imagine how do you go back to your parents and say he touched me and he raped me when your parents are relying on the friendship that was created to get you into college 
-hmm. and it's your only way. You keep quiet because now your family and everybody's involved in like, could you even imagine the shame that these girls would feel no, if they tried to frankly. turn around and talk, no matter what kind of relationship you have with your parents, even like really good solid ones. When you're a teenager and you know, you're, you're becoming an adult, you can make your own decisions. Like unfortunately in this society, um, and it's becoming better when you're a female and something happens to you, unfortunately we're all still conditioned to go, was that my fault? And luckily that narrative is changing. Women are being more empowered to understand that, no, that is not your fault and you're not supposed to be treated that way. But 20 years ago, yeah, no, mm -hmm. that wasn't gonna happen. So it's, it's really hard to look at it um, and not see just the exact grooming standards and the full playbook on how to exploit women it was it was just textbook in that case and you can take what he did and how it happened and you could go to any city in america right now and find it happening within five miles on a smaller scale and it's yeah. huge and it's happening every day and you know the, the epstein trial was out there it was in our faces we saw it happening and the and whatever happened to him, right? He he pled guilty. Suicide. Um, That's what I like to say. <laughs> suicide. <laughs> he himself. pled guilty. He pled guilty. He suicided himself. Um, so on that but, note, is it true that they dropped the charges against his guards in the middle of this very very quietly? They did. All right. They do They dropped the it's charges not odd on the guards at all. Well, that's another thing when it comes to <laughs> human, when it comes to human and traffic, when it comes to not sorry, when it comes to any kind of investigation, there's so many different reasons that yep. you can drop charges. There might just have been a chain of custody, like yeah. like evidence chain of custody that they they jacked up. And but a prosecutor- that, Even if there was, even if it was they, totally above board, the timing of that, conspiracy people, like, yes. I know, the, yes. you know, prosecutors and law enforcement, <laughs> They've got to start taking that stuff into Fuck. consideration. It's like, come on, guys. Like, yeah. did you think this through? Like, okay, you're going to drop charges. Could you have waited three months? Absolutely, you could have. Yeah. Uh, but, like, I would even if, uh, yeah. I would even, time. I would even like, and I don't have any actual knowledge of this, but I can guarantee you that the defense attorneys for those guards pressured them to do it right then, hmm. because like I would have. And and they probably bent to the pressure because I I got a chain of custody other things that hicked up hiccups and stuff like there's so many crimes that happen out there every single day and this the smallest thing like if I had evidence right here and I was a cop and I even let it touch your hands when I wasn't supposed to and I couldn't account for it for ten minutes it's yeah. gone and it's over and it gets away with murder so what tact did uh, Maxwell's attorneys take? In her defense, they was it. Did they go with it was their choice? No, they went with um, the girls were doing this as a money grab, and Maxwell was being used as a scapegoat for Epstein's crimes. Oh, yes. um, they tried to discredit the accusers um, and say that their memories weren't real. They brought in a false memory expert. Um, and was basically saying they don't know what they were talking about. They're making this all up for money. And that she is now just, they were trying to say Maxwell was a victim of the crimes of Epstein. And they're pinning it on her because he's no longer around. That's that's what their defense was. Mm -hmm. um, so they're trying to like, like chink holes in the armor of the testimony using dates and times and other things. And quite honestly, these girls were up on the stand and the memories they're having to reach back to were 20 years ago. Like, so even if we're just sitting here and we're thinking about memories that were 20 years ago and they were healthy memories, sometimes we screw them up. Now imagine trying to have those memories from when you're, you're being exploited and traumatized. So like remembering some of the things they might have been off by like one year, like their age of when it happened yeah. or certain dates or, oh, I paid for my tickets out to New Mexico. I'm, like they can't necessarily remember exactly what happened. And so they tried to use that. But in the end, it, it didn't work. Probably was the only path that they actually had. Sure. What uh, given both of yours, both of yours, both of your knowledge and experience. How many Epsteins do you think are out there right now? 
So the question is, what do you refer to as an Epstein? I'd say what's Epstein. like his level of relative wealth. Uh, what was he at? A couple hundred million, maybe. I've actually heard some. Uh, no, I think some, I thought he was in the billions. He hit billion. Okay, or, or maybe maybe so. I've heard like a little pe- bit of fluctuation. People can't seem to figure out where it came from necessarily, how he got it, his yeah. expertise. And with people with people with that level of wealth. I mean, you got to keep in mind they have armies of people to keep you from finding out how yeah. much they're worth. So, I've heard billions. I've heard hundreds of millions. For the a sake lot. of the question, so for the sake of the question, call it a B. He's got a, a B associated with his net worth, which of which I think there are a couple thousand of those in the U.S. Probably more globally. Mm-hmm. How many would you estimate? And so I'd break it down to when you. Even just look at the level of sex buyers in the United States in general. And so the one study that's out there is that 6% of men in the United States will purchase sex regularly, like every year. 20% of men in the United States will purchase sex in their lifetime. So if you want to take that 6% number of just purchasing sex, and then if you want to whittle down to whatever percentage of that is trafficking and looking for minors, which is a lot, lot less. Mm-hmm. And then if you want to take the number of billionaires we have in the country, and it's even less than that. So we're talking a small number. A very small number. Like, I'm not saying they good. don't exist, but it's not not like what so many people think. Like, there's bad apples in every single bunch. And yes, yeah. there's going to be bad apples in the multimillionaire and billionaire community. It's going to happen. Of course, it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be much shinier and brighter because it's going to hit the news. But and it'd be easier to focus on that shiny object and miss the 99.99% that I would imagine that's occupies exact, most of your guys' days. That's exactly what, exactly what's happening. Him. I mean, it's exactly what's happening. I mean, do we, do we come across traffickers who have significant wealth? Sure. Uh, in fact, Kara's hunting one down right now who we're a couple of years into this guy. Uh, he's smart. Um, I mean, he's very, very business savvy, knows the laws or has some darn good lawyers and accountants behind him. Um, he is, his, 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 uh, his time is coming. Yeah, no, I mean, flying, <laughs> flying in private jets, driving the most expensive cars oh, you yeah. could think, going everywhere. Um, but see that level of, that level of, of confidence eventually turns into arrogance and arrogance turns into complacency and gotcha. Yeah, you know, he, I like to say, he caught a case and we saw who he caught a case from. And then we literally just like vomited intelligence from like years. And we're like, here you go. And they're like, why, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so his time is coming, but but that's that's very rare. Most of our, most of the traffickers, and when I say most of, just to put this in context for the listeners, if they haven't heard before, like we work with over, uh, at this point now, even more, over 160 law enforcement agencies around the United States, increasingly around the world. We were just in Kiev um, de- helping them deal with some absolutely horrific. It's Florida, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Kiev, Kiev, Florida. Uh, helping Ukraine. Them, Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, helping them Super deal good with some, uh, uh, <laughs> some trafficking that was really, really terrible. Um, some uh, Trafficking you can't even imagine here in the United States yeah, happening overseas. Way worse than anything we've ever encountered before. Um, what was it? Of, what, uh, in scale or like the... Just the evilness the, of it. Okay. Um, that's what I assumed that you meant. Yeah. So, it, it, and this, this is like, I mean, absolutely terrible stuff. But over there, you've got oligarchs and stuff that are involved. Um, but so w- when you start talking about, okay, like global billionaires, probably a lot more, but when you start talking about places like Eastern Europe, yeah. your billionaires have illicitly made their money. So when we look at the, uh, the legal billionaires, AKA not Putin, um, when you look at the legal billionaires, in in the western world um we actually think it's a very very small number uh and and what's happening within within the human trafficking writ large i mean the major majority of human trafficking happening globally is actually labor trafficking right i mean so think you know trafficked labor on fishing vessels uh, or like what i've seen the migrant workers in the field where i grew up all of those things i mean those those are that's predominant form the most horrific forms are usually commercial sex in nature, or um, what we what we uh, uncovered in Kiev was some some surrogacy trafficking, like literally like growing babies to traffic them. Um, no shit. Yeah, for some uh, grow well 
I mean, uh, just because we we do like to speak truth to power, um, literally growing babies to harvest their organs for people who can afford the transplants. So we're talking livers, kidneys, things Hearts. of that nature. Hearts, yeah. Yeah, so they keep the they keep the mothers locked up and they're literally just breeding machines to yeah. sell that to to places in the world Fuck, where man. you can't get transplants like and there's you know, there's rich people out there in the world. If they need transplants for their children, they're able to pay for it. And that's that's not something we he, we see here in the no. US at all. Like that's not something that happens here. You have to go overseas to see that. And so like going over there and teaching uh, law enforcement and learning about the problems they're facing when that problem came up, like it was like being slapped in the face with like a brick wall. You're like, well, how, how, do, how do we fix that? Like, yeah. And- I mean, how did they realize that it was getting so bad they needed to reach out for help? They just kept encountering this and just didn't know what to do. <sighs> So your your law enforcement in places like Eastern Europe are so I mean our law enforcement are underpaid here yeah. over there it's it's orders of magnitude worse yeah we're talking apples and bowling balls yeah so they they really have you could almost make an argument they have no choice but to participate in the corruption to some level so when you have that happening um, then you have and you have you know oligarchs and actually um, some of our old brethren who are actually helping provide the muscle for them uh, getting gotta paid. get that paycheck Nick. yeah fucking douchebags I know uh, and and I feel like they should be forced repatriated and uh, we could discuss offline things that we could do to uh, oh balance that ledger there there are <laughs> there are extradition treaties Fuck. and uh, their time is coming it's gonna be a while it's gonna be a while because it's expensive and we've we have to fund it but their There's time the, is that's coming. The, the stuff they taught us is they're all just tools and tools they vary widely depending on the the hand yeah. that they happen to be in the output is only determined by the input yep what we've found though is that from from our level where we can assist overseas in this is finding those law enforcement officers and giving them tools to where they can make their jobs easier to take down, you know, some of these massive criminal trafficking organizations that are happening on their soil, yeah. and then also assist them in uh, finding the connections back here to the United States, mm-hmm. because so was it the second day where that happened? <laughs> so, oh, a direct connection yeah. back over yeah. the old because, US of A. I'm yeah. still working that, by the way, because <laughs> they knew they knew that um, they knew some US citizens that were engaging in some of the trafficking that was happening in Ukraine. So just because you can't engage in that in Ukraine, you can bleed the money out of the system by making sure that those U.S. citizens are held accountable back here. So if you're a U.S. citizen and you go overseas and you engage in anything associated with human trafficking, right, um, commercial sex with a minor, um, you know, any of the organ stuff, any of the surrogacy stuff, you can be prosecuted for that here in the United States. And so this, uh, this law enforcement officer in this case just kept going to the embassy and try not to be shocked, couldn't get anywhere. I couldn't get any support or any help. And so the second day of class, this guy comes up to us in real broken English and is like, hey, like, I, I need some help. I'm, here's what I'm trying to do. And uh, we're like, oh, yeah, no problem. Now, we had a time, time zone difference yeah. a bit. But by the next morning, uh, we had him in touch with the well, local level law enforcement in the jurisdiction that mattered. See, the thing is, too, though, when you're you're reaching in your law enforcement in the UN, in the U.S., your federal law enforcement, local law enforcement on a task force, whatever it may be, and you need to speak to law enforcement overseas, even if it's a country that where we have like a decent enough relationship with to talk to, there's some crazy channels to get mm-hmm. that approved. Hmm. So even figuring out if it was a decent lead, like to to do that and find that information and intelligence that's what the officer over there had issues with like because he couldn't even get anybody to talk to him at the embassy shocker like he couldn't get the information across and so what we did was we you know we bridged that gap we broke down the silos we made sure that everything properly was communicated in the legal means they were able to do that and you know pushed it forward and so and now you know the information's being looked at and what comes from it is what comes from it but i mean it's, well, it just goes to highlight that a lot of times what people will look at it as, a, as a conspiracy it's nothing to do with a conspiracy it's just a breakdown of the system or you have prosecutors 
have to pick their cases. Prosecutors cannot prosecute every single case that is that is thrown It'd be into impossible their, volume wise. Yeah, they they just can't do it, and so they have to pick and choose their cases. And so a prosecutor is saying, okay, well, I have a I have a, a five year old who was raped and murdered over here, and I have this twenty year old case that may or may not involve some human trafficking. I don't know. I'm going to go after this one, and I think that's exactly the the decision that we want them to make. So so a lot of it is just the system working as the system does. Yeah. How was the training received over there? Really well. It, it was it was awesome. They, you know, so training law enforcement all over the U.S., um, I've gotten really used to it, working with law enforcement here. So I'm like, I could talk to law enforcement. And the other analysts that went with us were like, we, we can talk to law enforcement. It won't be good. It's not but, COVID. It's just a normal sneeze. If it is, <laughs> give me some of that immunity. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Send it this way. <laughs> um going over there it's a post-soviet nation right so we didn't know how they were going to act and how they were going to receive us and i'm like so we're americans we joke around we laugh we break the ice we we want to create a friendship with our students when we're teaching them because we know, stare at you yes Stoic. <laughs> i would describe technically russians as fucking crazy in the best way they, i've had some amazing i've been to russia it's awesome had some great time <laughs> Totally. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. they're hard like people. Mission focused. <laughs> yes. So these officers, <laughs> like the first two or three days, I mean, business is business yeah. and talking back and forth. We had a real time translator, which was a like craziness, like had headphones and stuff. But, you know, it was very work, like work is work. And then we'd have breaks and like three days into it during the breaks, like they'd start joking around with us and laughing and we're like showing in pictures of our dogs and all this other stuff. And uh, some of them became friends and they were really great. Walk right back into that classroom and boom, stoic back yep. at work. Uh, but they were extremely intelligent, very smart. Very technically savvy. So yep. technically savvy. And to the point where like we're teaching them stuff and we're like, do they already know this? Because they are picking it up really, really quick. Fast. That stoicism from an outside perspective if you're not used to being around it people will just think oh they're dumb no 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 no, 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 no. not at all they no. are some of the most you guys have described it well some of the most savvy people that i've ever worked oh with. yeah they're chess players i mean you got to keep just, in mind also world. hard as goddamn nails too oh yeah <laughs> right you're gonna stand stand in bread line in the winter like you, you better yeah. have some yeah no yeah. we um we, you know we befriended a few of them who went out drinking with us and like you know would hang Be careful out careful and... with that game oh you are never gonna win it so you no. better have some strategies yeah, yeah. Be careful no, with that game no uh they were they were really kind, really nice. And uh, obviously I'd never been to a post-Soviet like nation. I hadn't been that far into Europe before. And uh, we were working from sun up to sun down. And like, it was, the food was amazing. The people were really kind. If you can deal with the stoicness of the people, which I actually appreciate because it's no BS, it's this is how it is. Yeah. I like that. Um, I really liked it there and I really enjoyed teaching them. I wish that we could go back and I, hopefully we will and do more because when it was received, the training, they're like, we need you here to train more people. We need you to go to this corner of the country in this corner of the country because what you taught us was just that good. And we're like, oh, good. <laughs> like, yeah. good. We we accomplished something and we didn't get to hear that until like the last five minutes of the last day when we were getting feedback from them. But um, it was awesome. And hopefully um, we are going to be expanding that training into different countries all over Europe and um, starting to take the methodologies that have been so effective here to assist them there as well. And Kara got to experience her first uh, follow not to lose surveillance. <laughs> She thought it was awesome. <laughs> well, okay. So, you know, we, uh, well, Nick went with us all, right? And we, we, this is your first indicator there's probably going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> we prepared accordingly. Like, we, we knew what we were doing, where we were going, and we had, we had plans if need be, if things were going to happen. And so we're on these planning meetings, and Nick's like, just to let you know, we're going to have uh, extra security with us. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, because of what I've done and because of what you've done, actually, Kara, you're going to yeah. be flagged when you come into the country, too. So you just swipe that old passport, the person with that so, stoic face. If when you could it, look through their eyes, it'd be like. Brrr. Actually, here's what she did. <laughs> so I, I scan into the country, right? A couple people go before me, no problem. And uh, a couple members of my team. And then she scans my passport in and she goes like this. And then she goes like this. <laughs> and I was like. Yep. 
know how this goes. And everybody Please else step just got to into line B. Yeah, everybody <laughs> else just got to go through. And then they were like, "We need your cell phone number, where you're staying, yeah. who you're going with." And uh, we had we had a nice little. Uh, like I said, security detail. Oh, it was it's, fun. The first night we were there, we all went out to dinner. Yeah. And um, we'd already experienced the, oh, air quotes, good, security at They're the hotel. They're there for your safety. We, so <laughs> we'd spotted them. Like and, the U.S. wouldn't do the same yeah, goddamn thing. We spotted them. And I'm like, Nick, did this, this, and this just happen? He's like, yes. I'm like, well, they're really bad. <laughs> and then we go out to dinner at this really great restaurant. And like when you entered it, in some places, I guess in Europe, it says no pictures in the restaurant or whatever. And they had signs up. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, respect the privacy of the people in the restaurant. So we're sitting in the restaurant. And there's this woman with like a nice camera and she's taking pictures and pretending. And then all of a sudden, like she's like straight on me and she's looking straight at me. And you could see her like zooming in the camera. And I just like take my drink and I cheers her as she took the picture. And then she went down to Nick. And I'm like, thanks, Nick. Now I have a dossier on me. I really appreciate it. How do you think they get that information that's on their computers? So we we have uh, we had two teams. Not so we had that team, um, and then we had another team that I caught twice, uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure they were. So so we had we had the really really freaking good team, yeah, and then we had the like maybe they were in training, I don't know, uh, but they weren't very good. Or the distraction team. Well, we we all know that uh, there was this little problem with the OPM computers, and we all know that. Uh, <laughs> Right. I that have oops. I all, have free credit monitoring for life off of that. All Thank security, <laughs> all security clearances were held in those computers, with the I exception that, of certain agencies. So, if your information didn't show up, and you happen to be reporting to a U.S. embassy, that was a problem. Yes, one stands out. It's an indicator. <laughs> yeah, everybody else is on the list, but these people aren't. Mm, yes. uh, yeah, and they all work for the same guy. And they all are. <laughs> th- let me see. It's all men. They're all. Uh, they all have their shirts untucked. Um, well, everybody else is wearing suits, and they all. They all. We find them in all the places that are off limits to Americans. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so come on. You don't need to be a rocket surgeon to figure it out. Uh, but part of it is. I mean, I understand that. You know, I mean, it was Putin who said that there is no such thing as a former KGB agent. Pretty I mean, easy fair. to read between the lines of what yeah, he's saying there. That's fair. So they think the same thing for us. So, like, I can say all day long that I, I'm i out of the CIA. I have nothing to do with the CIA. Well, you're required to say that. Yes, absolutely. Because obviously you're still working. My handlers are <laughs> supposed to say that, right? Uh, the chip in my brain is actually what makes me say that. I wish it would make me smarter. I can vouch for him. He really doesn't have the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but but they don't but they don't think so. Yeah. So it's like okay, well you're there, and and then you know how to make their job easy. And be like, hey, like I'm like gonna loiter a little bit here before I get into the Uber, so I can make sure that you guys yeah get your car in position. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean it was it, it was it was interesting, but what, what's more interesting is to see the like the ties between the the trafficking happening in Ukraine and Western money and where uh, Western Europe uh, and the Western European money and the Chinese money all kind of fit together into that equation uh, was was in in some cases horrifying and in some cases absolutely fascinating and so uh, we're actually um, our international division launched last year quietly as kind of a, a proof of concept it worked really well to the point that now we have a waiting list of countries asking for help so we got to figure out how to fund that but we're we're moving you know increasingly international and that and we already have the largest human trafficking database in existence so you can imagine what's going to happen oh God. when we start taking that into the international space it's just going to get bigger and bigger which is going to make it that much easier to fight human trafficking and then with the work that care has been doing lately uh, it just really uh, it's just going to make it so it's like shooting fish in a barrel did you see that it was largely the same playbook for lack of a better term in the eastern bloc countries from a human trafficking yep. perspective. Um, or did you guys find different TTPs? So it's the same playbook when it comes to exploitation of the victims, 100%. Um, the motives of the traffickers and how they make their money are different, though, because the moralities of the people and the the way that people are more easily exploited, and there's just so many different so much more impoverished yeah. that they're willing to take bigger risks, too. Yeah, And so 
when we were listening to cases that they were working on and uh, what they were doing and how they were working on them, um, when it comes from a law enforcement aspect too, it's different because their laws are different. And so the way that you approach a case and work an investigation and for them, their their chain of evidence and things they have to get signed off on and for them to stay within their legal compliance, it's just so much like it's it's so different. And the only way that we're able to slide into that different world and assist them is what we teach isn't laws or anything like that. We teach a methodology and our methodology still works on how to identify, locate, dissect a network and get the proper intelligence to act on. Now, when they get that information after they get that, um, because we taught them how, what they do with it, it's a different world than what our law enforcement officers do with it. Yeah. Fascinating. They weren't carrying Really? No weapons. You know, but that's actually not that incredibly, at least in my experience, in Europe, not no. that uncommon. I mean, look at UK, right? Most of them are not carrying. But so I asked him why. Um, and and they said that they, if they were doing an operation that required weapons, they had to go check them out of the armory, do that operation, and then check them right back in. And they qualified, he said, every once in a while. It was like, like once, a, once a year. And he just laughed. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but didn't some of them say they just had their own personal weapons for yeah. those operations? Instead of having to go check them in and out of the armory, they had their own, which is saying a lot, though, because they're expensive. Yeah. And, I mean, they make next to no money. And th- that came very apparent when we were using Google Translate on our phones in Russian, not Ukrainian, because the Ukrainian Google Translate was worthless. And so in Russian, we were talking back and forth with each other, and they are asking about wow, you have an iPhone. That's really cool. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, thanks. And they're like, we can't have iPhones. And I'm like, why? And it's like, they're too expensive. And I'm like, yeah, you're like, right. They're very expensive in in two your months, terms. Two months salary. Yeah, that's crazy. For an yeah. iPhone. And I, and I would just like, you know, it, it, you kind of be, you're taken aback by it. Because like when we were there and we were eating and we were going out to eat, the food was so inexpensive. And like we were... You know, just, hey, this is great. Let's go out to eat. But the way that we were eating in dinners and whatnot is not something that, like, even, like, barely the top 1% of Ukraine yeah. could afford. I mean, there, there was lots of oligarchs in the restaurants that we went to. Because, obviously, those are the safest places if, yep. you, mm-hmm. if you don't know where, where you're going and what you're doing. And uh, it, it was... It was fascinating to work with law enforcement, though, because some of them really cared. But then you saw that law enforcement officer who made the same amount as everybody else who showed up and he was dressed pretty nice and he was pretty articulate and he had an iPhone. And you're like, hmm. There was one. (laughs) There was one with that iPhone and Apple Watch. And I'm like, I got my eye on you, buddy. Gee. Yeah. One of these is not like the other. (laughs) I wish more people traveled and saw stuff like that. I would travel every week of my life if I could. I love it. Well, just it. imagine that in context that it would provide. I mean, most kids in the U.S., let's say if they're going to get an iPhone, it's probably starting at eight or nine. Probably, yeah. As a Christmas gift. And then right. it's largely an expectation of quality of life beyond that. Right. And it's, I mean, that starts there. That's like one example of probably many. It's uh, it's one of the things I'm most appreciative of, of my military time, is going and seeing the differences, the stark differences like have fun trying to explain the difference in uh, value of life between the united states and afghanistan oh yeah <laughs> like, it's impossible or that, quality of life that said something that shook me while i was over there and then like we went out into the city to eat and then the one day we got to walk around uh, nick you weren't there for that but we didn't see hardly any children and i'm like is it because it's the middle of the city um like, because is it like school? Is it the middle of the week? And I just started thinking, I'm all like, maybe they're just not having that many children here. <laughs> well, and also maybe they're working. Yeah. A lot of those In children are working. outside of the city. Yeah. And, yeah. Or however they can. Yeah. In, yeah. in any way that they can. Yeah. So it's, it was, it's interesting to see as we start pushing overseas, start dealing with the trafficking issue overseas. And, and it's, we have a, we have a, um, an unfair advantage, if you will, in the fight against human trafficking overseas in that 
all of the all, all of the training that we do i mean training is training right it's nobody's threatened by training but all of the data analysis we do is here within the four walls of the united states which is a very very safe place to do it so uh so that makes it that means that even overseas if a corrupt law enforcement officer makes makes some data disappear well, we still got copies yeah and that's really really important in the fight because um with what what we do at deliver fund you know when we were talking earlier about victims having to testify well really the methodology we've created makes it so that victims don't have to testify in order to get a in order to get a conviction we've had plenty of cases where victims haven't haven't they, haven't testified. The traffickers end up playing out because uh, whether they have a public defender or if they have their own defense attorney that they paid for with their victim's money, um, they they advise like you, you're going to need to take this plea deal or you're going to get your full sentence yeah, because this is the, the, best you're gonna get. the right. intelligence is overwhelming. And there was a case, I think, last summer of a case that Dolores Fund had been working for like five years. Um and the last trafficker was going up on the stand and he hadn't plead out and we're sitting there and this is in New Mexico and we're sitting there and I'm like, are you kidding me? And they were scrambling to find the survivors and I was, I was assisting in that. I was all like, let me find her for you. Let me help you. Let me mm -hmm. get that information for you. Just in case he plead out like an hour before because they finally talked him into it. And so he plead. Because he, he would have gotten the full sentence. It was just the intelligence was overwhelming. The digital fingerprints were there. You can't lie about your your fingerprints. But and you have you have two different types of trafficking though. You have like in the in the United States with predominantly internal trafficking, right? So most of the trafficking victims in the United States are U.S. citizens. Almost all the customers are U.S. citizens, and most of the traffickers are U.S. citizens. So, uh, in a place like Ukraine nobody's got any money. So there's no trafficking that really happens in Ukraine. It's usually export. So they're exporting oh, yes. to China, Spain, Germany, where the money France. Is. Right, right. So so it's, uh, you, you know, you might have, you might have the drug dealer who lives on the, you know, socioeconomically depressed part of town, but they're selling in the rich school district, right? Because they, they can't really sell in their own neighborhood because no one's got any money. Yeah. So that's that you, you have the same thing happening within Europe where uh, it, it's easier for them to export, obviously, across those borders as well. So uh, that's ma that's making it so that we take the it's the same approach and the same uh, target centric analysis method in creating these intelligence packages. But we're just doing it for the purpose of instead of feeding it to Ukrainian law enforcement, the Ukrainian law enforcement can feed it to the German law enforcement who can then bleed the money out of the system. So it, it just it's just it, it instead of reverse planning it, it's just starting from the beginning. Are you guys so you guys uh, or you, Nick, gave me a little look behind the curtain, a little NDA first and then a look behind the curtain of the system, which is a, a strategy and approach I recommend. Don't yeah. go the other direction. Um how would I describe it? Technologically advanced. You guys are seems to be continuously leveling up with the oh. abilities that you have. Are he you? He hasn't finding... even seen our newest stuff. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. Here's the question, though. So, I'm assuming that you guys are having a technological advancement that seems to be ridiculously on par with everything else. Technological. It's just like generation after generation. Are the people that are trafficking? Are you noticing that they're leveling up at all, or are they just staying as the same? I would imagine at some point. They'll figure something like they're like, oh, every There's, time this happens, that happens. So we need to change. So it's a Hobson's choice. There's nothing to level up to. <laughs> Seriously, there, there, there is nothing. I mean, adver uh, human traffickers in the United States of America and predominantly overseas as well, they have to advertise online. People want to see the product. Mm. Right. You're going to go buy anything off of Amazon where it's like, sorry, there's no photo of this. You know, whatever it is you're going to buy. Right. Uh, Maybe like Phillips head screws. I sure. Do that. Right. Yeah. Um, Pencils. You know, toilet paper. Right. You don't care. It says toilet paper. Well, Two ply or four. <laughs> there is a difference. GSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Decorative raised pattern or no. <laughs> but the, so by advertising online, they have to advertise their product, and um, and there's no way to encrypt a picture. So because if you encrypt the picture, then you can't see it. So until you have some type of like secret decoder goggles. Uh, that everybody just so happens to have the same algorithm for uh, you. You can't 
like they've, they've literally from a technology standpoint gone as far as they can and there are uh there are ways of collecting information off the internet that leaves no trace uh, so you know scraping leaves a trace people can tell what you do what you can do but if you've got a screenshot engine that can take over a million screenshots in a uh, in a minute well now it's kind of hard to hide uh, so even if they throw an advertisement up book a girl and take it down an hour later we still got it uh, so you just can't move faster than the computers and they have to advertise that's i mean that's the achilles heel of the whole thing they isn't have, that what they use the dark web for and for clarity, by saying that, I'm at the limits of my knowledge of what that is. Yeah, so I've heard of things like the Onion router, which I didn't realize was the same thing as the Tor browser until like really recent. But <laughs> so, <laughs> but that if so, I'm being honest, <laughs> so that that actually highlights the point of why this doesn't happen on the on the front facing internet. Because right? everybody's a dumb dumb like me, and they don't actually know what it is or how to access it. <laughs> they can't. Yeah. They can't get the product in front of the customer. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. At the scale that they need in order to make money. Is there trafficking happening on the dark web? Sure. Absolutely. Yes, there is, which also isn't out of what our exactly grasp. exactly is the dark web? I, do you want me to give you a breakdown on the dark web? I actually and think the a lot of internet? people would be illuminated by okay. it. Okay. All right. So I want everybody to imagine an iceberg. Okay. Right, and I not the lettuce, the like the floating piece of ice. Thank you for that, because I was thinking the, about the ranch. Titanic See, killer, right <laughs> the Titanic killer, an yep. iceberg in the ocean. I want you to step back from that iceberg, and you could see it, like say you're half in the water, half out, right? And so you have that top level of ice that's bopping away with polar bears and penguins on it, and then underneath is the rest of the iceberg, which is like two thirds of the iceberg. So the top that you can see is the front-facing internet. The Safari, the Google. Yeah, which the, means that the, the internet that is indexed by search engines that it's easy for you to access without knowing a very specific uh, okay. address. Right, and then right underneath the water down through the, the middle part, because if you cut this down into thirds, so that middle third, you're looking at it, and that is what you would call the deep web. And the deep web is something that we have all been on before. Does anybody have a bank account? I hope so. All right, good. If you've logged on to your bank account, you have been on the deep web because there's really? access control into the deep web. Now, what's in the deep web? You have bank accounts. You have college indexes for schools and libraries. You have anything that you're using dual um, authentication to get into. So your... <laughs> Like any databases that you're using and searching through and having to put like passwords to get into, that's that's where the deep web is. And that's without those passwords, would it be on top of the iceberg? Yes, the login page, page is on the top, top of, the of the iceberg. iceberg. Gotcha. The login gets you below the waterline. Right. And so that's where most of the stuff on the internet We're oversimplifying, is oversimplifying, in- but I like it. it I'm yeah. so, the jest. And it's that's actually where you spend most of your time. If you're logging into anything, that's that's where you're going. Um, now, the bottom part is what we would call the dark web. And it is not as much as you think it would be, but it's down there. And to get down there, you have to have specific web addresses. And it's absolutely utter nonsense. Like, it's just like a bazillion different letters in your URL. And you have to know how to get there. It is actually pretty easy to get there, but you shouldn't go down there and start poking around unless you're protected. If you really want to go to the dark web, Google it, figure it out yourself. I'm not explaining it here. Um, But when you're down there, there's places that you can go that are not good. You can buy some very bad things everywhere, murder to hire to. You, you can buy children, you can buy illegal documents and all these different things. And the whole idea of the dark web is that you're concealing yourself. You're using that Tor browser you spoke yep. of when you go down there. And there's specific ways that Tor browser works and why it works. And if you're not using it down there, you're going your, your whole computer is just going to explode on you because you're going to catch viruses and people are going to target you and come through your computer. Hackers are going to laugh at you and all these different things. So it's they call it the dark web because they want it to be super scary. Um, the dark web is just a conglomerate of things that people don't want you to necessarily find unless you're specifically down there to find it. And you're specifically down there doing it so nobody else can see you doing it. 
So there's no Google down there. Like you have to oh, know. There is. Oh yeah, there's many. There's search engines. Mm-hmm. Okay, but to like find a specific oh, thing, yeah. you'd have to like know the exact mm-hmm. address to put in. There, so there's there's certain search engines in there for these illicit markets, and you can go down there and make your searches. But you have to know how to get down there first, and you have to make sure you get down there protected. If you if you don't, you're just going to screw a bunch of things up. But honestly, nobody and has probably end up on le- uh, law enforcement's radar yes. real fast. Yeah, very quickly. Very quickly, if you go down there, it's not illegal to get on the dark web, but the chances of you crossing a legal line once you are on the dark web are exponentially higher. Very high. Also, there's yeah. these things called ethical hackers, which they make it their hobby to go down there and just destroy people. Really? Yes. Keep it up, guys. Keep it up. We <laughs> we, we bow our hats to you. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Do they so. call the search engine down there Dougal? Dark web Dougal? <laughs> Because it would be really awesome if they did. Guarantee you somebody just changed it. <laughs> right. It, or is in the process of changing it right now. It happened. It happened. Yeah, the dark web isn't as mysterious as everybody like thinks it is. Um, but there's there's nothing down there for anybody I would that just isn't. Subscribe the, the special total... operations community exactly the same way. It's not nearly as mysterious as most people think it is. No. No. <laughs> hey man, those floors don't mop themselves. No, it's a bunch of idiots with machine guns. Yeah. To so... be honest. <laughs> We're like semi suicidal and have <laughs> substance abuse problems. Yeah, but only E5 and below, it's fine. It yeah. all cleans itself up at E6 and above. Yeah, yeah. The, the large majority of trafficking is front-facing on that open-facing Well, the barriers part. to entry with anything, whether it's online marketing or selling something on Instagram, the more barriers to entry that you add, your, your drop-off is going to be huge. Yeah. Exactly. And that's where traffickers find their victims, too, is on the front-facing internet, on open social media profiles. They're looking for you know people to target that are vulnerable, that they can go after, and that they can use, and it's all right there. I think I talked about this last time, but the uh, it, it's an important point to reiterate why we are seeing such an explosion in human trafficking in the U.S. and 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 actually globally. And uh, according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, a pretty darn reputable source, uh, we're we're partnered with them in many ways. We work very closely with them. We we're big fans. They they have the best statistics that we know of. And in a, in a five-year period, they saw an 846% increase in suspected child trafficking cases. What, what were we talking, what five-year period was that? Uh, 2010 to 2015. Holy cow. Yeah, exploitation. Um, yeah, and, and, children, and when you so. overlay, when you overlay mass adoption of smartphone technologies, right, broadband connected microcomputers in our pockets with this, I mean, it, it makes it so that you can order a child to a hotel room same way you can order a pizza and for about the same price. Uh, and I've, I've said that many, many times publicly. I saw what you did there with the pizza. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're just connecting like I did that. <laughs> so for you conspiracy theorists, I'm giving you a, I'm giving you a secret trail to follow. Yeah. Oh, um, good gracious. <laughs> You're making my job harder too, Nick. And, and if you want to know he more, chose those words, not me. If you want to know more, just DM Kara the Huntress, <laughs> and uh, and she'll be happy to tell you more. So, um, so you think it was tied to the advancements in technology? We, we know it was. And so, when you look at and think about it this way, there's always been predators out there. People who are willing to exploit children, and, and right. I mean that that's that's as old as time. Yep. However, for the first time in history. A non-familial 40-year-old man who's 3,000 miles away from a 12-year-old girl at the very moment of vulnerability when she says that she's mad at her dad, which is at pretty much every 12-year-old girl on social media at some point, can, can actually start talking to her at that very moment of vulnerability when her guard is down. That, and, and, then, and then can groom her over a period of months to years along with 100 other girls. And they're playing a numbers game. They know that they've got to talk to, you know, to make the math easy, they got to talk to 10 to get five to reply to them, to get three to agree to a meeting, to get one to actually show up. And that one who shows up, her life is irreversibly yeah. destroyed. And, and so that's what we're seeing on the technology side. So with the technologies that, that we're building, uh, we just actually hired two new developers. Um, we're... Um, uh, we're working with a PhD out of Columbia on the world's first machine learning algorithm uh, that detects human trafficking, like first one ever. Uh, poor Kara has spent major majority of the last couple of months actually training that algorithm. Uh, and so you're building Jarvis, essentially. Uh, we like to think of it more as like Skynet for human trafficking. Because eventually we'll have drones, lasers, you know, the whole nine yards. I can get on board with that. Yeah. Absolutely. 
right? Autonomous drones are probably a bad idea, except in this case. <sighs> God, but that's if, a whole other conversation. But if, so. <laughs> but if they're only trained properly to go after the human traffickers, it's not a problem. So don't buy or sell children and you don't have to worry. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, I was thinking about this literally today when I was doing dishes. I was thinking about like un technology has been a part of warfare for a really long time, right? It's whether it's like for, a uh, let's say somebody from the software, like I'm hearing stuff now where they have scopes that have integrated range finders that oh, I know. sniff the barometrics and move your fucking reticle. So it's just always point of aim, like, point of impact. Where, where? But right. So that like that's tech involved at the boots on the ground level or mm -hmm. the radios that we would call aircraft with, or right. how is this sensor able to track somebody while they're moving? Like it's been involved there forever. Teaching a robot how to kill somebody is super easy. That's oh, yeah. an ordinance problem. Well, Teaching the, it when it should kill somebody is the conversation. Well, the, the Turkish <laughs> the Turkish drones in uh, in Libya, right? They, I mean, completely, I'm not familiar with these. Oh, so completely autonomous, uh, um, lethal drones, and uh, were were deployed in Libya. What um, were the, I would love to see. Well, I, the coding would make no sense to me. I would love it idiot's version of what their parameters were i have no idea uh <laughs> but the problem was is so they were they were trained to identify military age males with weapons and they started shooting farmers with shovels oops that's what i'm saying yeah teaching a robot to kill somebody is simple teaching a robot when it should kill somebody right is the hard part but here's a really here's a really interesting uh question we know this is coming. We know we know the Russians are actually leading the charge on uh, on uh, lethal autonomous drone technologies. That's good. that's a serious leg up in warfare. Not to have a human in the loop. Are we going to be willing to compete? Oh man! Right. I would, I would also bet oh, the Iranian. <laughs> or is the better competition figuring out a way to just decimate their entire fleet of those? Yeah. I would also bet. The Iranians are pretty far along themselves on that. Their drone technology is always but good. But here's, again, it comes back to, in a lot of ways, the value of life and the different philosophies that countries have. I, I, I have a difficult time explaining to people, just through my own experience, the value that at least will be provided lip service to in this country mm -hmm. is incredible in comparison to some of the other countries that I've been to Absolutely. where they'd be like, of course, autonomous drone just fucking kill everybody. As long as it's not people yeah. that I like, I mean, so look, look at their quality of life and their view and value of human life is just different. So yeah, I could see them being like, of course we are going to design autonomous drones that are going to shoot you on site they, and have, and sleep like a fucking baby. Well, we, we have uh, American defense contractors who've done that. Um, it, you can you can see a number of YouTube videos on some proofs of concepts of uh, semi-autonomous drones are about the size of that avocado quadcopters um, with uh, facial recognition software built into it, and you can literally give it a target, and it's got a it's got a shape charge in the bottom of it, and so it will <laughs> oh, it will God. it will and these things fly fast. I mean, you're not hitting this thing with a with a you're yeah. not shooting it out of the air with a shotgun. Um, these things move I pretty mean, maybe quick. You're not, and and they're small. Yeah. So you need lots of them, and or you can have lots of them. And so okay, you got one. Now what about the next one? That's got the same. That's got the same target. And then they they actually uh, flare, right? I mean, they they target they the put head. Put a shape charge. They through your flare face. and they put a sharp shape charge through your forehead. And for people who are curious, what that would do. Um, what was the painter that just threw dots <laughs> on the canvas? <laughs> no, these are really small. Yeah, these are I, really small. So these shape charges, like they, they're, they're. We're not talking RPG shape charge here. We're talking a very, very, very tiny, like micro machine. Still feel like a shape are we, charge. Are we into the Jackson like, Pollock category. Yeah, <laughs> we're talking like EFP kind of shape charges. So when they like enter the body, they exit bigger and expand. No, like, uh, so a shape charge it actually. No. It starts. What would this? This is con like a, cave, right? Yeah. It actually rotates, and, and it so rotates it, it turns so it into flowers out. It doesn't actually necessarily flower out. It turns into basically a a jet of molten metal that is right. Kind of kind of like the it EFPs. That's yeah. what I just said. But no, <laughs> but no, it but doesn't it, mushroom like a bullet. Yeah, it's okay. kind of like the EFPs. The EFPs when they invert, they they liquefy into more of like a um, like a shotgun pattern. That's why they were. That's why they uh, the uh, Iranians were manufacturing <laughs> them as domes. This is this is more of a, a point. So yeah. when okay. it 
when it inverts, it, it, it becomes a very, very, very precision, very targeted, right? So it's like the difference between a 12 gauge and a, you know, and a, and a, a, a standard, uh, and at a larger level, jacket round. it's not even the inversion of the, the projectile that would kill people. Like in an armored vehicle, it's the overpressure it's pressure that kills people. So oh, okay. it's, it's, it sense. has that ability to penetrate through and basic, I mean, create so much pressure and liquefy would be a good description yeah. of what it can do. So it's damn, I think turn, turn uh, into mist. Yeah. Um, we just need to have EMPs everywhere. All explode. Yes. Tactical. It's, it's just beep. You're, EMPs, like. yeah. So yeah, what, what's gonna, what's going to happen when you're like, you know, you're in the middle of it, and you're like EMP out. Yeah. You're like, oh, people are gonna be like, shit, dude, you just stuff. killed our comms. Yeah. <laughs> well, Smoke good thing signals. I went to comm school. Get out that dipole. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember the formula for the inverted V? I'm like, fuck no, I don't no, remember, I do that. Not remember that. <laughs> No, that I mean that is a good question. If other countries are willing to do that, what's the what's the threshold for the United States? Are we willing to match that, or do we find something that defeats that technology? Yeah, are you willing to know. be competitive, or do we do what we did? Was it Iran where we ha- hacked in there and fucked up their uh, enrichment facility? The centrifuge mess up. Yeah, yeah, that 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 took a long. We time. We should do that. Yeah, that, I can that neither was... confirm or deny the accusations <laughs> that you made against me. No, I, I saw really a documentary like about to this too. I saw that documentary. Yeah, I know. There was, was a specific type of coat. I, it was there was a name for it. I actually think it was Stuxnet. The, Stu- yes, it was Stuxnet. Actual, I was going to say Skynet. The actual that's name Terminator. that is um, uh, all completely open source, and Correct. in the documentary um, is uh, uh, is Olympic Games. So, so I would say that would be a better option. However, that option may not be successful. So uh, I wrote a paper in grad school. Um, and all, all my professors are all these like, you know, Kennedy school policy wonks. Right. And I'm, I wrote this paper about how our response to, uh, foreign hacking should be a uh, kinetic response. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get an F? <laughs> I, I, I passed the class. Uh, I got it 85 or below was failing and they gave me like an 86. Because I knew they knew they couldn't fail me, but let's just say uh, it did not go over well. Red like, balloon. Yeah, I'm like, well, what? what? They're like, well, you need to have a proportionate response. Says who? Like anybody who's ever been in a fight, like you don't want a proportionate response. Like if you have a, a proportionate response, you are unprepared. <laughs> like, well, I mean, that's an interesting concept for sure. The kinetic response to digital warfare. Whew. Maybe that's what Space Force does. Probably. Uh, maybe. Still haven't figured it out. Yeah, no idea. I wonder what their dress uniforms look like. They're the same, but it looks like they have Star Trek insignia or something. I'm pretty they're not, sure. They're not like, oh, really? They're the same as the Air Force, but. I was hoping they'd be oh, like those, those yeah. SpaceX. I'm sorry, uh, I'm putting the Air Force uniforms oh, at the bottom of the list. Marines are obviously their class A's, top shelf. Can't, can't beat anybody. They cannot, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, the, the Air Force. Uh, the Air Force is called the Chair Force for a reason, <laughs> and the uh, the dress uniforms reflect it quite well. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> God, what the hell are we talking about? We were down the rabbit hole of the deep web. Yes. We were at the deep web, and front-facing trafficking is not down on the deep web. I haven't yeah. thought so. about that they were limited. They have to, like you said, they have to show their wares. It's basic economics. The, the uh, supply is virtually unlimited. It's vulnerable pe- populations, vulnerable people virtually unlimited on the globe uh the demand is actually limited because there are people who are unwilling to cross that line right i mean let's face it uh the what'd you say this the statistic was 20 percent of men at some point will engage in some type of commercial sex over their life yes six percent regularly yeah um we all know the the human nature of men that number would be a whole heck of a lot higher were it not illegal. Um, and I'd really like Correct. like to see what those statistics are in places where there where prostitution is legalized, right? It's I, my guess is it's probably higher. So, and then you know who's actually admitting to that stuff on these studies? So let's just go ahead and make the assumption that's the floor. It's probably a whole lot higher. So um, demand is limited, uh, especially in countries where prostitution is illegal. Uh, supply is virtually unlimited, and what do you have have when you have a uh, unlimited supply? Very low barrier to entry. All you need is uh, essentially a smartphone with an internet connection. You don't even have to have a SIM card in it. You can literally just yeah. use the free Wi-Fi at the at Starbucks McDonald's. or whatever. Yeah. And so, very low barrier to entry in a limited demand. You have a price that's bottomed out, and so um, you you human traffickers have to do business at scale. 
and and also there's this myth out there that you know human trafficking uh, will generate more money than narcotics because you can use the victim over and over and over. Well, it's a complete myth and it's not rooted in science at all. Um, you can leave you know thousands of pounds of of cocaine in a shipping container and come back a couple of years later, it's going to be just probably worth more. You can't do that with human beings. Human beings require management. Human beings require care and feeding. Ask anybody who's ever met a pay or you know, ever uh, had to meet a payroll be, for their employees. Yeah. So when you when you look at it through that lens, um, the low barrier to entry, right, high overhead business with a uh, w with a limitation on the amount of commodity that you can manage, and that's a really important point. We find that most traffickers. Some of the really good ones who've established whole businesses, like like large scale businesses around this, um, they've got lots of people managing uh, what they call stables of girls. But for the most part, most traffickers are managing somewhere between two and five girls, and that that's the capacity at which they can handle and the capacity at which they can manage. So when you start adding all these different factors up, and you just apply basic economics to it, it it kind of makes sense. Yeah. So if 20% of men will at some point in life pay for sex, 6% routinely, out of pure curiosity, where do the numbers net out for women in that? I have never come across a woman buying sex just herself. I've seen women that are buying sex for their partner, like as a gift kind of thing or like an anniversary, whatever it may be. Weird. I was going to say truly should reevaluate your relationship. But no, I, I, had, I have to assume there are some women that would do that, right? I mean, I've never I've had a conversation with a woman. Like, yeah. No, I haven't come across it. I haven't come across any law enforcement officers that have come across women buying no women. Shit. And there are, there, there, obviously there's male prostitutes out there and some mm -hmm. male trafficking victims, but um, they're... <laughs> Safe to They're say, purchasers. astronomically lower. Yeah, but yes. the, the purchasers of the males are predominantly males, um, mm -hmm. purchasing okay. them as well. I, I just haven't necessarily seen it. I'm saying it. I'm not saying it's not out there. Yeah, but it's extremely rare for there to be female purchasers. This is one of the interesting things about the Liver Fund and working with you know, like literally having a scalable model. Uh, where when we work with over 160 law enforcement agencies around the world, and all that data is coming in. Plus, we're building out our own data sets. Plus, we have our own analysts still building out data sets. You can see how if there's a pattern there, you're going to see it eventually. Yeah, you guys can parse out all that data. Yeah, and so what, what we can tell you is like we don't know that that's not happening. What we can tell you is in seven years of collecting data and analyzing data and doing this work day in and day out, we haven't seen it. And the law enforcement officers, so the 544 law enforcement officers that we trained last year haven't seen it. And, uh, and because we, we have questions that we ask them all just to try to, just to, try to see, like, it, is this a thing, right? Are children being sold in the basement of pizza parlors? Well, no, they're not. And, and we know this because of this, this like constant, constant flow of data that, that goes two ways between law enforcement and prosecutors and Deliver Fund. You guys think it's a solvable problem? Absolutely. What would it, well. Define solvable. So it's like. <laughs> I would, well, I mean, yeah, that's, I guess it's a shitty way to phrase it because in my head I'm thinking, is it something that we could stop? But knowing human behavior, I would say that's probably not a plausible. We have the solution. It just requires a lot of work and a lot of effort, and it requires everybody to be on board with it. Right. So you're talking about in law enforcement, you're talking about in society, the combination of the tech, two everything. tech companies, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, all these Snapchat, all these companies need to get on board, as does, you know, MindGeek, Pornhub, uh, OnlyFans. I mean, we, we got a list. So, so if we have. Do you think they will? Well, so what we could do is is we could, to answer this question, we could, yes, it's solvable in that we could reduce it to what we currently see with money laundering. Money laundering actually doesn't happen that often. And when it does happen, it only happens at a very high, very sophisticated level that law enforcement is usually all over. 
So that's that's the level we could reduce it to because right now it's a scale problem where you have so many so many small violations, you know, for lack of a better term, that you can't really ever get to the big ones. Yeah. Uh, because you're just, I mean, it's it's a whack a mole problem. But so part of our strategy is actually fighting human trafficking with these companies through commerce, right? Equip training and advising the entry point in the market, which is at the social media level. Um, and then working with banks and then working with the Ubers and the Airbnbs and all these different companies. So if we could make it so that a human trafficker can't get an Uber, can't get a, uh, um, you know, can't get a VRBO, can't get a plane ticket, can't buy gas, can't buy groceries, can't put their money in a bank. If we could make it so that that, that was the, the reality for them. Then, then they're probably going to go do something else. And the reason it's so much easier to fight human trafficking than it is narcotics trafficking or weapons proliferation or terrorism is it, it rolls right back to the fact that they have to advertise. And if you advertise on the front-facing internet, you leave a thumbprint, and then our computers pick up that thumbprint, and then Kara makes you her hobby. And yeah, so it's it's a solvable problem. It's just going to take everybody and not just from the industry side, not just from the law enforcement side. The public has to be aware, too. The public has to be educated in understanding and against what human trafficking is and what it looks like. They have to want to also go after the labor trafficking market. They want they need to purchase goods that are only being made when their supply chains are clean from mm -hmm. human trafficking. So, you know, the the public opinion is very important on this issue, whether it be sex trafficking and labor trafficking. We can all day educate, provide the tools that are needed to fight this to law enforcement, to corporate entities, but until the public is behind ending this as well it just it's not necessarily going to happen at full force like we need it to and the whole point of it is is going after the trafficker taking out that trafficker whether it be through legal means or whether they have to figure out something else to do because they can't even buy groceries anymore because How of their sweet actions would it be able to fuck with somebody like that transaction denied transaction denied <laughs> oh we do it yeah, I mean, God, I would like we, to be a part do. of that team, yeah. but I would also like access to the cameras, like at the gas station, where the guy's just like, motherfucker, <laughs> what do you mean you won't work? What do you mean or my account like zero? a bottle of water at the grocery store, and it's just like, <laughs> and he sm football spikes it into the ground. Like, I would need to have that to truly get the sense of job fulfillment that I'm looking for. I would need to have access to both of those. <laughs> So the first year we were working with a, a publicly traded bank, uh, we uncovered uh, over 20 human trafficking networks to the point that they were like, hey, guys, like, slow it down. We we got to deal with all the yeah. intel that you've given us so far. They did a great job. Uh, but all of those traffickers, uh, they they all got reported to FinCEN and FinCEN does what they do, which is they hit, they hit the magic FinCEN button, which is freeze account because the government that can changes freeze your funds. Sure. Anytime they want, they can they can freeze your funds. They don't they don't have Not to. Not mine. That's why I have Bitcoin. Ah, I'm just joking. I don't have a whole Bitcoin. Other, <laughs> no, come on, man. If I couldn't figure out that the Tor browser and the Onion router <laughs> were the same thing for a really long time, do you just, really think that I'm deep into the crypto world? <laughs> Coinbase has made it so easy for you. But that's that's another one is is uh, the cryptocurrencies, right? I mean, you, you people say, well, you know. We've heard this many times. Well, uh, human traffickers will just they'll just start using cryptocurrencies, and cryptocurrencies are are untraceable. Like, okay, which have is fun with that. Because hilarious. Isn't, the best part, isn't one of the things about the blockchain is that there is a record it's completely of every traceable yeah. Yeah. back to its beginning. That's yeah. the whole point. I think what they mean is very few people have the ability to actually oh. parse that information and probably track the transactions. We're we're teaching law enforcement how to. How to it's do no it. problem. You guys are like the fun police. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Hey, they did call me the buzzkill for no reason. Yeah. So. Yeah, man. So, you know, we, we, we stay, we stay ahead of these. Uh, and part of the way, part of the reasons why is, uh, Kara has, uh, and, and a couple other of our analysts have, um, infiltrated some like chat groups, I think would be the best way to, to put it like Facebook groups and things like that, that are where traffickers will actually share best practices. So they'll be, they'll be talking to, you know, one of her sock puppet accounts, which they think is another trafficker and Kara's got the lingo down pretty good and they're just sitting there telling her like, oh, do this and do that and, you know, avoid the cops here and, 
uh, we hear that there's something going on over here, and then we just take that information, just feed it right back to law enforcement. So there's this human intelligence component. Yeah. Uh, but it's an it's an electronically enabled human intelligence. So when uh, when we get them to tell us essentially what they're doing, then we can just get in front of it with technology tools and methodologies that make it so that it's very easy for law enforcement. You know, law enforcement doesn't have any clue how Microsoft Word works. Most law enforcement officers or how their email works when they send a case to a prosecutor. They just know it works and they yeah. just need a tool that works. And too much of the uh, the training in the past has been focused on trying to turn law enforcement officers into computer scientists. And there are some who really like that and want to do that. But most people join law enforcement because they want to carry a badge and they want to point guns at people. That's, and they want to confront they want to confront the bad guys. Well, you can't do that with a keyboard in your hand. Yeah. So they just need the tool and they need the tool to work. And so that's what we build is we just using both kind of crowdsourcing their their best practices, our best practices, and then bringing all the data into what uh, our chief information officer calls the curatorium, which is this just massive AWS bucket full of data. We put it all in there and make it so that it's just, to them, it's just magic. It's like, well, we don't know. We push the button and it gives us the information we need. Not to mention, we, we also work directly with survivors who have an inside to what had happened to them and oh, how they sure. work that nobody else has. So, And when you say work directly with them, I mean, we have three of them on staff, salaried, benefited positions um, like that. They're that embedded in what it is that we do. Is the legal system capable of prosecuting this at scale? Is that one of the issues as well? I mean, identifying yeah. the crime is one thing and then actioning the crime through either a law well, enforcement arm and then... So the if we were even to be able to acquire enough law enforcement officers to go after all the traffickers in the United States, which we don't, we don't have that ability. There are so many of them that if, if we took every single law enforcement officer and had them go after the traffickers, we might get close to getting them all that are out there. But then, like you said, the, the prosecution side of it, yeah. like the, the courts are backed up as it is. And then also the, the prosecutors out there and the way our legal system works, there are some amazing prosecutors out there. But then there's also career prosecutors out there who aren't going to take the chance because prosecuting a human trafficking case is easily one of the harder crimes to prosecute because your main point of evidence is actually the trafficking victim. And having to put a trafficking victim on the stand is very terrifying to a prosecutor because a lot of these victims are just so torn apart um, when it comes to like their mental health, their physical health and everything. Um, putting them on a stand is hard because a defense attorney will just tear them apart. And um, it, it's difficult to try a human trafficking case. That's why the information and intel intelligence we provide gives law enforcement the ability to go to their prosecutor and be like, hey, they're going to plea out. Yeah, here's the leg Try work for this you. case. Well, there's also that's where the the partnership with industry comes in. So if you if you trafficked another person, you you made money off of that, you put that money in a bank, that's money laundering. Money laundering is math. You either did or you did not. And so prosecutors love those cases because they don't require a victim to testify. Yeah, it's right? very black and white. Uh, and so, um, so the for law enforcement to you know kind of arrest our way out of it is look is like trying to kill our way out of the war on terror, or I like to say uh, like trying to shoplift Walmart out of uh, out of business. It's it's not going to work. It's a very very important component, but really. The prosecution of a trafficker is the failure of all other systems, and so what we have done is is by by really mapping out the human trafficking market, and then looking at for looking at the surface area for all the different points of attack, and then creating a tool to attack each one of those. So if the if the scumbag can ever can ever contact the girl on on Instagram in the first place well that's a win but if that fails then you can make it so that okay well you know you know who this guy is and you see him starting to communicate with with her in the DMs and you cut that off but if that doesn't work then you know when she tries to, when he tries to uh, uh, push her to another another 
uh, platform for communications, ones that one that he feels that law enforcement can't subpoena as well, the AI picks that up and shuts shuts down the communication. And then if that doesn't work, then it goes to the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, right? And then she she's now in his system, right, in his business. And he's trying to book a plane ticket, but he can't get the plane ticket, right? I mean, like, I don't know how we're going to do it yet, but we're going to make it so these guys can't buy groceries. We've already made it so that it's very difficult for them to to engage in a lot of political, uh, or a lot of, uh, not political, but um, polite society and and engage in commerce. And we're, we, have, we have companies engaging us almost weekly, very quietly saying, hey, and these are very recognizable companies, publicly traded companies, most of them saying, hey, can you please help us with this issue? We want to get to the bottom of it. Uh, what would, so I, it, the demographics of the audience is tough. Like you get some download information, but I have, I know I have a, some, a good amount of military and actually a good amount of law enforcement, but for people not in those two buckets, mm -hmm. parents, let's go parents, mm -hmm. or maybe young men and women who are listening. How would you help drive their awareness of this? Like, what tools would you try to equip parents with? Because, and I say that through the lens of having a 13 year old daughter who is absolutely addicted to her phone, mm -hmm. social media platforms, and she communicates not only, well, <clears throat> with, I'm assuming, people that are not in her direct, yeah, it's, it's everybody. It's her direct social circle and, you know, it's the internet. It is the internet. I mean, how, where would you start parents? How would you arm them? And yeah. How, how we, so we have a lot of information on our website uh, at deliverfund.org. You can go to our website and go to the blogs and news section. And for like the last year and a half, two years, um, we've been putting information in there to help equip parents. And so tools for parents to speak to their kids about trafficking. There are tools in there to identify trafficking, what to do if you see trafficking, um, how to protect your children on the internet. And there's a lot of strong guides in there and information that you can look at uh, from just a basic standpoint of being a parent myself is you have got to be involved in your children's lives and that also means their, their digital lives. Right. You have to have open communication and people really try to be like, oh, but it's my children's privacy. Absolutely not. You pay for that phone. There's no privacy on the Internet. And if you raise your children from the start that you have open access to their whatever there is mm -hmm. on there and that they're communicating to you what they're doing. Um, like, hey, what are you doing on there today? Like really simple, starting from when they're really little and asking them, oh, what game are you playing? Getting interested in what they're doing. Oh, are you talking to somebody? How are you talking to somebody? That shouldn't be set up that way. Understanding the controls for whatever they're on, having access to everything, then teaching them responsibility and teaching them that stranger danger of the internet. Like, we wouldn't, and I said this on the last time I was here, we wouldn't just open a front door to a stranger when we were kids. You need to teach them that the same thing yeah. when they're online. And so being involved in your kids' lives in all aspects, including when they're online, because such a large part of their life, whether we like it or not, is online these days. Um, well, and, and, and to know that it comes from a lot of places you don't, you can't, yes, um, we have an active case right now, uh, active duty military member trafficker right putting on a uniform every day going to work trafficking uh trafficking i mean that shocks me night. zero percent it's yeah. a yeah. swath of society just like everybody else there was a, the same issues uh, and problems so, there was a united airlines pilot who was it was now a convicted trafficker um one of the uh, give kara a little bit of a shout out here on her instagram um or no, it's on our YouTube channel and Deliver Fund YouTube. Uh, our digital marketing team put together uh, the, this group of uh, or the series of videos called "Hunting with the Huntress." What I really like about that is is if you're if you're uh, if you're forewarned about an issue, you're forearmed against that issue. And so Kara will actually you just got all these little one to three minute videos where she breaks down how a how a trafficker is working on social media like literally she will she will have that traffickers instagram open and be like stopping and playing videos and 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 breaking down their their verbiage and, and what it is that they use and how it is that they work and they're they're what a lot of parents want 
which I think sometimes gets to the heart of the question, is they want a, hey, show me that five minute video that I can watch. Yeah, and this now, fire and forget tool. <laughs> yeah, and now I'm I'm educated and that's just not the yeah. case. Uh, and so we, we educate our children and, and being nosy and being nosy parents is incredibly important, I think. However, um, it's also about teaching our children what it looks like, right? Right. I mean, hopefully, I, I'm sure you're telling your, you know, your uh, 13 year old that there is no man that is going to meet her every need. Like that doesn't oh, exist. For sure. And as soon as she sees that, or she thinks she's starting to see that, like a huge red flag, run the other direction. Um, otherwise, dad's going to have to go all man on fire. So it's understanding the behaviors of traffickers and how they will act, and teaching your children what that looks like. And the the Instagram stories that are archived on YouTube, that's what it is. Like I put these Instagram stories up of traffickers, social media and pointing out what they're doing, how they're acting, whatever it may be. And then it's archived. I mean, that gives you some sense of that, but understanding the grooming processes um, of traffickers and how they, you know, they work their way in and making sure your children are aware of that and that, these guys are going to act like they're your best friend and they're going to act like they love you and that they want to shower you with gifts and treat you right and make you a star and all these things. And that is not how the world works. Like when things are happening like that, you have to, you know, step back and figure out what's going on in any aspect of life, but that's how traffickers act. And so educating yourself as a parent, understanding what tools you have available, open communication, teaching your child, your teenager, what trafficking really looks like and how it can happen, it's all really important. Do you guys ever worry about being the public face of this? No. No. Mm -mm. No, we've, we've had... Uh, I think I kind of understand the uh, gist of the question. Yeah. Um, we have had de deliver information de flows two ways. Yeah, deliver yeah. funds. Deliver funds um, involvement in trafficking cases has come out on the stand uh, many, many times. Um, we've we've started to gather or, or started to gain such a reputation with prosecutors that we have prosecutors now are actually starting to use some of our targeting packages as evidence in court. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but it, it has happened. That has led to successful prosecutions. Um, we have actually found that when, tra when human trafficking detectives are trained by us, uh, it gives them a lot of credibility on the stand, uh, which defense attorneys don't like. So we've never even made a subpoena or made a witness list, much less gotten a subpoena. Um, it'll happen someday. And we actually, quite frankly, are, are kind of stoked for that to happen. <laughs> You know, you would probably be a defense attorney's worst nightmare. Worst nightmare. Oh, I can promise you that. That's yeah. my, my. It would probably happen. Thing. It'd be like one and done. That would be I mean, like so a legend inside. <laughs> do you really want want somebody like Kara who has a massive amount of credibility with the jury? Because the very first that you know the defense attorney um, wants to start cross examining her, well, the very first thing that the prosecutor is going to do is establish her credibility with the jury. Yeah. Do you really want her on the stand calling your victim or your, um, your client a human trafficker? Cause that's as good as done at that point. So, so we're not too concerned about that. Um, there are traffickers obviously who know that we were a source of intelligence, but it's no different than the national center for missing and exploited children who deal with these cases all day, every day. At the end of the day, deliver fund does nothing other than scale the capability of law enforcement. And so we're not doing anything that law enforcement can't do. And when we say we work with over 160 law enforcement agencies across the United States, the predominant form of that is, so it's not like we are feeding Intel to 160 every single day. We've created the software that does that. And the ones that we're actually directly feeding target packages to are usually associated with very specific operations. So last year we did 42 operations. But within the broader law enforcement community that we work with, there was hundreds of operations. So our goal is to teach them to fish so that they can go catch those fish on their own. Makes I, sense. I will say that um, the videos that I put out there, there was a trafficker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was a trafficker meme page, as I like to call them. Traffickers have podcasts. Traffickers have, you know, big yeah. social. Who doesn't? Right. <laughs> Everybody uh -huh. does these days. Everybody. I saw that picture you two sons of bitches posted today. <laughs> I even commented on it. I'm like, how dare you? <laughs> Starting without me. I thought we were meeting at 3.30. <laughs> we were practicing. <laughs> <laughs> so. Those are good mics you guys have, though. It's quality. It's good. 
The, so I'm sitting there, and I was actually teaching a junior analyst. I was showing him um, social media of traffickers. I'm like, you want to follow this guy because he talks about this, and he'll lead you to like 30 other traffickers. And I'm, I'm showing him how you infiltrate, infiltrate the networks. And I go to the page, and there's a picture of me front and center on his Instagram grid. I'm like, oh, really now? <laughs> And I'm like, I've made it. I was so excited. And I clicked on it and it was one of my videos. And the comment on it was something along the lines of like, who pissed her off? We, <laughs> we do have some companies out of Boston that really help us on the, um, uh, the, the person security side, the, the personal intelligence security yeah. side. Um, so there's, I mean, we, we're not dumb. We, we've, we've taken some, uh, you taking the necessary taking measures. some necessary measures, yep. but at the same time, it's like it, there. If the traffickers are going to go after somebody, there's so many people that would be on their list well before they ever got to us. I mean, if they got if they finally whittled the list down to us, like there there's some bigger problems. And if they want to get that close, I fully um, execute my Second Amendment rights. So people have asked me, they're like, "Don't you ever worry that the people that you used to go after will come and?" Like try to find you. Like so, they would first have to worry or hope. I'm like so, I'm like okay. So they would have to a identify me. B figure out where I live now. C probably surveil illegally you. get into the country, surveil me, and then want to come do something. And my answer is fucking come get it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God, if you're that motivated, I mean, like if, okay, if you have that much time. <laughs> oh, it's a thing, and it's and, and it's not like trying to have like a risk adverse attitude it's it's just and you want to do all that on yeah. my home court advantage exactly oh, like oh, please okay i mean there's some things that you can turn off and there are other things that you can't no so it's yeah uh what are the near and long-term goals for you guys oh man uh so uh world domination is always long-term of course right? i mean that just I mean, goes without being said yeah um so, at a personal and professional level um <laughs> well we were redundant there. <laughs> there <you go. laughs> Fair. Uh, so, ah, boy, um, yeah, long-term goals. So we, uh, ah, should I say it publicly? I'll say it publicly. You're allowed to. So You're we, not me. <laughs> we, yeah. Um, we actually have a goal, and this will actually be the first time I say this publicly, and this seems pretty grandiose, but when people understand what the playbook looks like, they're like, oh, that's actually super doable. Um, between the work that we're doing with law enforcement and more importantly, the work that we're doing with commerce, our goal is to drive a billion dollars into the fight against human trafficking by 2040. That's going to 20x what the, what the, uh, what the U.S. government does uh, with no strings. So if we want to help the Ukrainians, we don't need to worry about pissing off the Russians. We can just yep. go help the Ukrainians. Um, and really what I'm finding is that the, the reason, and, and for people who don't know, the reason that the special operations community is, is so successful outside of the individual operator is because of Harris and Tails and H&K, yeah. right? Yeah. And defense contractors yep. and Palantir and, I mean, the, the list is long. Um, so were it, I mean, do, does the... Defense industrial com complex maybe need to be reeled in a little bit, sure. Um, but do we owe them a debt of gratitude? Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. right. The Air Force isn't building ballistic missiles. The Air Force is not building the F thirty five. The I didn't build a single thing that I carried with me ever. No, I did sew a few pockets. The yeah, I, I sewed <laughs> a lot of gear. Yeah. The the eight which which now like you know freaking now you can just go buy it from Ferro Concepts, right? Of I mean, what it would have killed to have that kind of capability back then. But the, the reason I'm alive today is because of Harris radios. It's because of A-10 Warthogs. It's because of Apaches, Whoever right? Whoever makes the night vision goggles and yeah, all it, that. Yeah, it's because of freaking Spectre, man. Like, yeah. how many times did they save our bacon? So Quite a few. So why aren't, we, why aren't we essentially creating a defense industrial complex for the purpose of funding and fighting human trafficking? And that, that is what we're doing, and that's why... Um, I say this with a lot of bias, you know, if, if you're really concerned about the, the, the human trafficking fight, the smart money is on Deliver Fund because we have a long term 20 plus year plan for going after it. So that that's what we're doing in the long term. Uh, but the short term, 
actually belongs to Kara because she's the one who is literally training Skynet. Uh, yeah, so the short-term goals is just um, bringing all of our technology in-house and developing it out 10x better than what we were using out of house. Uh, getting as much intelligence as possible that is easily accessible to analysts and law enforcement um, and commerce to, to fight the problem. Like, this problem is easily solvable when you have the right tools, the right money behind it. Um, the information that we understand, we know from the several years we've been working this fight with law enforcement and survivors is like, hey, we're, we're going to make the easy button. We're going to do it. We're going to make it easy. We're going to save time. Um, you know, bring those investigation times down to like right now we're we're sitting at like six hours with the tool that I'm currently working on. We're cutting out the first like two hours immediately, just like that. And, and so, then that's just going to lead to yeah. bigger and better software tools, which is going to lead to bigger and better software tools, which is going to lead to more data and on and on and on. And so, then we work for the robots. Hey, man, <laughs> do they pay well? I think they're going to pay us in like water rations and food. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. It might go. It might go very, very wrong. I just, you know, it might go very wrong, Matrix style. But <laughs> what is the best way for people to support you guys? I know that fundraising is a huge portion of this. And you were saying, I think it was when you were on the first time, the the Deliver Fund store sold out. Yes, which is awesome. By the yes. way, yes, yes. Uh, thank you for for all those supporters. Uh, you, you know. When Kara's, you know, we're talking about these incredible technology tools, and I say that she's building. We actually have a, a team of programmers um, stretching everywhere from New York into into New Delhi, and I mean, we're talking PhDs in in machine learning and and uh, in artificial intelligence. But there's got to be a human that actually does the work to make the machines work. Uh, the the currently. work, yes, the work that our currently we're working <laughs> on it. Um, the, the work that our analysts do when they embed in operations with law enforcement, right? I mean, in Houston, we actually have a, a intelligence analyst embedded in law enforcement. Like, like, we're that close to the fight. Do you know how important it is for them to know that they have, a, they have donors standing behind them to make sure that they have the resources that they need in order to, in, in order to, to pay the software programmers, in order to... Uh, you know, pay the, uh, uh, I mean, everybody from the AWS bills to the programmers to the analysts. I mean, it is very much a team effort and we can't do it without, uh, without our supporters. And so the, the best way for people to support us is, is to go to deliverfund.org forward slash donate and smash that donate button. Uh, that's, that is the best way. Uh, outside of that, it's, Social media is really the best way to, to share things at scale. Um, I, I, I assure you, and I'm, I'm not saying we'll never make a mistake, but we try so hard to make sure that everything that we put on social media is essentially peer, peer reviewed by survivors of human trafficking and they feel good about what we're putting out there, that it's, that it's peer reviewed by law enforcement and they feel good about what we're putting out there. So, so if you're wondering whether or not something is real, is is Wayfair really shipping children to you? Um, oh, I, you that know, was in one of the documentaries. Too. Yeah, um, <laughs> hit hit up, hit. Make sure you follow Deliver Fund. Right, we're at Deliver Fund on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. Uh, and then really uh, following Kara's uh, social media at Kara the Huntress. And she does such a good job of breaking it down as well as other members of our team to really show you what's real and what's not. So, so the first is if, if it's, if it's important, then support the fight. And then the second is spread the word so that we can actually make sure that the right information gets out there. Accurately. That's the thing. When yeah. you see something about human trafficking or child exploitation online, I want you to stop and think for a minute and be logical about it. You've already lost, lost. Half the internet. Yeah. <laughs> well, say. crap. Do you have any easier steps they could follow? Oh, just bug just me. Just bug me and ask. If you're gonna share, if you're gonna share human trafficking content, just share share deliver fun stuff, and you'll know you're good. I'll let you guys close it out. We've been out here two plus hours. Respect your time. Get you out of here. Hey, thanks a lot for having us. Uh, this is an important part of of spreading the word. So we yeah, appreciate you. I appreciate it. You guys have an open open invite anytime. Awesome. What we should do next time is hold up like. Um, Mugshots of pimps. Oh, I'm in. 
which oh, I don't we, we know. Got, we got him I don't know if that's legal, but I it think is we should. Oh, totally legal. <laughs> it's legal. Totally legal. <laughs> and like, we got him. We, uh, yeah, we got him. It's like, we'll print them out and I'll just have like, okay, so this guy, this is what he did. And this guy's, this is what he did. Yeah. <laughs> and this one's in jail for this long. And yeah, no, absolutely. I'm going to find a woman that paid for sex. I have to now. Because you guys sure have found there. one. I'm sure they're out there. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, let us know because that'll, that'll be... Uh, <laughs> That'll be the proverbial camel's nose under the tent that, that we'll, we'll start pulling on that thread to, to, to find the rest of them that we haven't found. Perfect. Kara, what do you got? Closing thoughts? Uh, no, not really. We'll talk about Yellowstone when we get off of this here. Okay. Um, we need to stop right now because that sounds amazing. The, the, follow, the follow documentary about the state of Montana? <laughs> yes. No, thank you guys for your time. Like I said, open invite. Hey, thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. I used to have a pretty good outro, but it's a new year and I need a new outro. So I'm working on that. So just, you know, hold your horses, if you will. Sip your brown water from Black Rifle Coffee and chill out. Most commonly, I get asked questions like, hey, how can I support the podcast? And the biggest thing, if people are listening or watching this and they want to support the podcast, do me a favor. Tell somebody about it or write a review of the podcast or reach out to me directly with your feedback, whatever you feel comfortable doing or don't do any of that shit if you don't want to. You want to take it a step farther, go to shop.clearedhotpodcast.com. And maybe you need a bumper sticker or a vinyl sticker for your window or, I don't know, a t-shirt or a bag of coffee. You decide. But the biggest thing, like I said, is perhaps just help me spread the word. And that's it. I'll see you guys next week.